laugh every time. Oh, Charlie's is probably the most chill. The tie between Charlie and Steve. No, I wish. Thank you. Oh, yes, I wish. Mortado. Nice to see you. Thanks for being here. He's not having it. Jillian, he's, he's, trying, he's not having it. I'm he will not, he will not do that. It's sad for me. He's got trip four or five. He's got trip four or five. Four or five. Four or five. Sometimes I mess up. Hello, Madam Attorney. You saw all those, you saw all those emails that went out. We're getting ready to do all the interviews. Everything good? Okay. Yeah, if you have any concerns or questions, you let me know, okay? He's coming. You have. You have. Oh, my Mark Anthony said that was loud. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Good evening. I want to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order, <clears throat> excuse me, um, on May the 6th, 2019. And I certainly want to welcome everyone and thank you all for being with us tonight. We're very glad to have you. And now I'd like to ask if you could please join me in a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. And now I'm going to ask if Council Member Reese could lead us in the Pledge of the Flag. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, colleagues. Um, we are privileged tonight to be joined by the Scouts of Troop 405. If they'll come on up to the front and lead us in the pledge. And folks in the audience, uh, if you're able to do so, and if it's your practice, please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Good job, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Thank you very much to our scout troop. We appreciate you all being here and leading us in the pledge. Thank you so much. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilmember Alston. Here. Councilmember Caballero. Here. Councilmember Freeman. Present. Councilmember Middleton. Here. Councilmember Reese. Here. Thank you. Well, now we're going to have our ceremonial items, and you can see we have a special guest. <laughs> I'm going to begin with National Drinking Week proclamation. I think this meant National Drinking Water Week. 
Whatever works, Mr. Mayor. I just, I just read what they had printed on the Whatever. program for <laughs> Whatever you say. The other one's every week, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Council Member Middleton. Uh, I, want, uh, I would like uh, Mr. Tom Lucas, Superintendent of the Brown Water Treatment Plant, if he would please join me and whoever else might happen to be here. Hello, nice how are you? Nice to see you. Hey, nice to meet you. Whereas water is, ba is a basic and essential need of mankind, and whereas our health, comfort, and standard of living depend upon an adequate supply of safe, clean water, and whereas the city of Durham continues to take a lead role in source water management and protection, and whereas the city of Durham consistently produces a reliable supply of high-quality award-winning drinking water, and whereas climate change may impact the availability of this previous natural resource, and whereas our drinking water and water resources are undervalued, and whereas we are all stewards of the water infrastructure upon which future generations depend, and whereas dedicated individuals and organizations, such as city employees, industry leaders, scientists, environmentalists, and students, have made significant contributions in developing, operating, and maintaining our water treatment and distribution systems, protecting and conserving this precious resource and educating the public on the value of this resource, now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim May 5th to 11th, 2019, as National Drinking Water Week in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to help make Durham a more sustainable community by embracing the theme of this year's Water Conservation Poster Contest, Water is Life. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this, the 6th day of May, 2019. And I'm going to present this to Mr. Lucas. Uh, for any words that he or anyone else may like to offer. So thank, you. thank you, Mayor Shull, members of the Council and City Management. As superintendent of Durham's Wade G. Brown Water Treatment Plant, I'm probably a bit biased, but I always enjoy seeing water management recognized for our best known product, clean, healthy, refreshing, and reliable drinking water. I invite all of you to take some time and read our annual water quality report, which is hot off the presses today and available to our customers in English and Spanish. Also, we hope you'll enjoy your, our, your Wayne Drop can koozies and whatever you decide to put in them. Mm. <laughs> um, Mr. Mayor, we appreciate your thoughtful remarks highlighting the importance of National Drinking Water Week. Locally, this year's celebration is even more important considering water management, and more specifically, the brown plant, was recently recognized for having the best tasting drinking water in North Carolina. <laughs> and also some of the most humble employees. <laughs> this, uh, this honor bestowed upon us by the North Carolina American Water Works Association and Water Environment Association is something we are extremely proud of. It's also a great reminder of everything that goes into a glass of de delicious Durham drinking water every time someone turns on the tap. The people, the pipes, and other, other infrastructure, the equipment and technology, the constant testing and quality control. It takes more than 300 of us here in water management to make that happen 24-7, 365. On behalf of the awesome staff at Brown Water treatment plant and across our department, I'm honored to accept this proclamation celebrating that drinking water week, something we all work hard on every week as part of our commitment to the health, well-being, and safety of everyone here in Durham. Again, thank you all for your support of everything we do. Okay, so we mentioned that we do a poster contest every year for water conservation. Again, we've done it this year. We had over 250 entries, 12 schools participated, um, 19 different teachers supported, and of course the parents also supported. So we really thank you guys for all your efforts and we love seeing your posters. So now we're going to announce our local winners as well as our state winners. So some of these state winners, actually all of them, do not know that they won at the state level, so this will be a surprise for you guys. All right. 
So starting with our kindergarten through second grade division, in third place, we have Ada Solomon. <laughs> All right, well, we'll get a time for Wayne to make his way. <laughs> All right, and in second place, we have Isabella Boyder. And in third place, we have, oh, in first place, I'm sorry, we're going in the other order. We have Angel Rendon Cruz. <laughs> Angel and Isabella won first and second at state as well. So congrats, you guys. All right. And in our third through fifth grade division, in third place, we have Iris Emerson. And in second, second place, Mackenzie Wiles. And in first place, we have Jenna Kim. All three of these contestants won first, second, and third, respectively, in state as well. All right, in our last division, sixth through eighth grade, in third place, Tess Mater. I don't think Tess is with us tonight. Second place, Camille Sherman. And in first place, Mira Hansball. And these local winners also won at state. Congratulations, guys. Wayne is a little, Wayne drops a little awkward, I find. <laughs> Best Wayne drop in the world, though. Well, that was fantastic. Congratulations again to all the winners and our state winners. That's amazing. That is just great. All right. Um, now we're going to move on to Children's Mental Health Awareness Month, and I'm going to ask Tika Dempson, a family coordinator for Alliance Behavioral Health Care, to come up. And Tika, if there's anyone else that you would like to join you, Good to see you. Great. Whereas to promote awareness of positive mental health, well-being, and development for all children, youth, and young adults ages birth through 26 years in North Carolina. And whereas the leadership in Durham, North Carolina recognizes that mental health needs and treatment be on par with medical needs and treatment. And whereas families shall not feel stigma and shame to seek treatment for their children and youth and be able to discuss openly their need for help without public retribution. And whereas children's mental health promotion needs to be available to everyone, education on the identification and use of child strengths to support success and promote mental health, as well as anti-stigma, inclusion, and social skills education should be available to all citizens of North Carolina. And whereas available school-based mental health programs and positive behavior interventions and support should be considered as best practice and be encouraged to be practiced in every Durham, North Carolina public school. And whereas children are recognized for having unique needs for recovery of mental health, emotional, behavioral, and substance use issues, and not being combined with the adult mental health population for treatment. And whereas effective mental health treatment services to strengthen families, youth leadership development, and family partner peer supports results in children and youth overcoming trauma, becoming successful, and contributing Durham, North Carolina citizens in a safe environment in their homes, schools, and communities. And whereas the Durham City Council of Durham, North Carolina, North Carolina Mental Health Planning and Advisory Council, National Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health, Alliance Behavioral Health Care, 
NC Families United, the NC State Children's Collaborative and the Families, NAMI NC, Public Health, Department of Social Services, all medical facilities, all legal entities and communities who have children, youth, and young adults struggling with emotional and behavioral health join to recognize Children's Mental Health Awareness Month. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim May 19th as Children's Mental Health Awareness Month in Durham and commend its observance to our citizens. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this, the sixth day of May, 2019. Congratulations, Stephen. not much to say other than what um, Mayor Shul read about the proclamation. However, um, I was sitting there thinking this evening that when I created the proclamation a few years back, wondered why and how could I get our young people to understand the value of their presence who may live differently. Um, and that, And this is why I hope that you understand the value of the proclamation. You're bringing voice to many who may not, you may not even be aware of their mental illness. They have a right to live, to be happy, to be educated, to play with their friends without stigma. And by doing so, you've also opened the doors for the families, the adults who are caregivers for our children who have mental health, who are living with mental health, because they are now able to work and hold jobs. And it's no longer a secret when you get a phone call as a parent and you have to leave work to say, what is wrong with your child? And for that, I say thank you. I say thank you for our young people who befriend other children who may not look and talk and behave the way you do. I say thank you and I applaud you. Our children are not our future. I believe our children are now and we must continue to support them in all that they do. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to uh, introduce our public historian, Eddie Davis, uh, for some remarks. Uh, you all may know that uh, this is our sesquicentennial year. And as part of our sesquicentennial year, Eddie is our public historian here in Durham. And he has been bringing us wonderful history moments here to the Durham City Council meeting so that we can learn about our past together. And uh, tonight is another one of those. And I'm going to ask Eddie to please come forward. Uh, and, uh, and introduce our history moment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good evening, council members and staff. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to organize and present avenues for history to be remembered during the sesquicentennial of our city. Uh, many of these presentations have involved people who were long-term residents of Durham. However, the history that has been made by Durham's newer arrivals should be acknowledged and remembered as well. Later this month, Durham and the nation will remember and commemorate the 65th anniversary of the landmark 1954 U.S. Supreme Court decision called Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. Our community is fortunate that Mr. Earl Pollock decided to move to Durham about five years ago. In 1954, Mr. Pollock served as a law clerk for Chief Justice Earl Warren and thus had some very close involvement in the evolution of that high court's decision to overcome, overturn the legal separate but equal doctrine from American education. As we saw from the recent film, The Best of Enemies, it took Durham and other communities some time to fully adjust that decision it was handed down on May 17, 1954. Now for a brief presentation about the Brown decision, I was going to present to you Mr. Earl Pollock. Uh, Mr. Pollock unfortunately had a bout of illness and uh, was it was recommended that he not appear tonight. However, he decided that he wanted his daughter, Dr. Della Pollock, who is in the communication school at UNC to present in his stead. So ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dr. Della Pollock.
Thank you, Mayor, Council, Mr. Davis, for this extraordinary opportunity to speak on my father's behalf. It's a, it's a great privilege to be here. I only wish my father were. I think you would enjoy meeting him. I will uh, speak his, his written remarks. So I, I trust you will recognize that when I say I, I am not him. <laughs> My involvement with the Brown decision came about because of a few twists of fate. In June 1953, right after finishing law school, I arrived at the Supreme Court to begin a clerkship with then Chief Justice Fred Vinson. The segregation cases were pending before the court. The cases had already been argued once, but no decision was forthcoming. Instead, a second oral argument was scheduled in October. The ultimate outcome was very much in question. The court was sharply divided. The separate but equal doctrine had become deeply embedded in American law and society. Strong arguments were made that in these circumstances, overturning the doctrine could only be done by Congress or a constitutional amendment. And even if a plurality of the justices, say five or six, voted to overturn separate but equal, a split decision of that nature, with other justices writing dissenting opinions attacking the majority decision, would divide the country and prevent any chance of public acceptance. This was the situation in early September when Vincent suddenly died, a day or two after I had driven him home. President Eisenhower quickly replaced him by appointing Earl Warren, then governor of California, because of Vincent's death, I thought that my clerkship experience was probably over. But two weeks later, when Warren arrived to take office, he asked me to clerk for him, and I promptly accepted. In order to give the new Chief Justice a, a chance to get settled, the re-argument was rescheduled from October to December. After the re-argument in the Justices' Conference, Warren persuaded the others not to vote at that time. He did not want the judge's preliminary views to be locked in too early. In the following months, Warren undertook a low pressure campaign, one on one, to persuade the court to unite on a single opinion. He felt strongly that on this issue, the court should speak with only one voice. At the end of April, Warren called me to his office and told me that the court had reached a unanimous decision. He gave me a memorandum he had prepared, what he called an outline, and told me to write an opinion on that basis. The memorandum laid out a narrow set of parameters. Instead of dealing broadly with government segregation in all its many varieties, the memorandum focused exclusively on public school segregation and its harmful effect on black children. Warren gave me several specific instructions. He said the opinion should be short, non-legalistic, understandable to the layman, and even suitable to be printed on the front page of a newspaper. He also said that speed was of the essence. Having finally obtained unanimity, he obviously didn't want to lose it. That weekend at home, in view of his emphasis on speed, I worked on the assignment for 24 hours straight. On returning to the office Monday, I gave my draft to Warren, together with a short cover memo recommending separation of the District of Columbia case from the four state cases, because as a federal jurisdiction, DC is not directly subject to the 14th Amendment. The chief accepted the recommendation, and to my very pleasant surprise, approved the, the draft, except for a few word changes. The next few days moved with breathtaking speed. After the addition of footnotes and some final polishing, copies were distributed to the other justices together with a co cover member memo from Warren stating that the draft was prepared on the theory that it should be short, readable by the lay public, non-rhetorical, unemotional, and above all, non-accusatory. I recall delivering a copy to Justice Black while he was in the middle of a tennis game at his home. <laughs> Except for a few editorial suggestions, each of the other justices gave their approval, and it was agreed to announce the opinion at the court's next public session the following Monday, May 17. At the May 17 session, Warren read the opinion word for word, 
but with one exception. In the sentence declaring that, in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place, he inserted the word unanimously, causing a noticeable stir in the courtroom. Over the next 65 years, the Brown decision has proved to be the indispensable foundation for the enormous progress that the country has made in racial relations. I feel very fortunate to have been a witness to one of the most important milestones in American history. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, I just think it's important after hearing um, uh, Dr. Pollock's words for us to find a time somewhere during the course of this year to have Mr. Pollock to just be here so we can see the man who wrote that decision. That was cool. <laughs> uh, we have a person in Durham who drafted the opinion on Brown versus the board, the Mount Everest of American ju jurisprudence in the 20th century. That's really fantastic. Please give our regards to Earl Pollock, Ms. Pollock. Mr. Thank you so Mr. much. Mayor, before he leaves, uh, and also noting, uh, it, it's important to note that Pauli Murray actually put together the the legal justifications in her, I can call it what it is, the legal book that she put together, that she wrote, mm -hmm. that, it, that actually Thurgood Marshall used. And so we've had two involved. Thank you. All right. Now I'll ask if there are any announcements by members of the council. Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate it. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. For most of my time, on my, sorry, my microphone was. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Um, for most of my time on the city council, um, we've been blessed to have uh, two really fantastic local government reporters working, um, really working with us uh, here um, to spread the word about what's going on in state government, to ask difficult questions, to make us a little bit uncomfortable, sometimes a lot uncomfortable, um, and really to be our indispensable partner in, uh, in governing this great city. And I just wanted to pay special attention tonight because I believe it's the last council meeting where both Dawn Vaughn of the Herald Sun and Sarah Willits of the Indy Week will be uh, present and reporting for those publications uh, together. Uh, Dawn is moving on to join the state politics team uh, for the News and Observer, their sister publication, and uh, Sarah will be joining the Durham District Attorney's Office in Community Engagement and Communications. Uh, I'm really excited uh, for them, but really sad for us um, so thank you, uh, Dawn and Sarah, for um, making us better through your coverage. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> okay, enjoy that, because that's hardly ever going to happen with us. <laughs> we really do appreciate you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, other announcements by members of the Council? Council Member Caballero? Please pointing at my colleague. Oh. <laughs> Going to the... You're looking over here, and I'm like, no, you got people Thank on the right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to let everyone here know, and anyone who might be watching at home, that voting is open for the city's first participatory participatory budgeting cycle. Um, it started on the 1st of May. It goes through um, the end of the month, May 31st. You can vote online or at one of the city's pop-up events, which will be um, happening periodically throughout the month. There'll also be PB representatives um, coming, going to middle schools and high schools in the district, uh, community events, et cetera. So um, please take the time to vote. A couple of our council members voted today here at City Hall, and there's evidence on social media. <laughs> it's really easy. Um, it's, it takes about 15 minutes, and you get to um, actually participate in making decisions about how public money gets spent. So please take the time to go online and vote at pbdurham.org or uh, attend one of our pop-up events, and you can vote in person. Thanks. Thank you very much. Councilmember Freeman. Thank you. I, uh, I also wanted to 
echo, um, I think Tika, is she still here? Um, Tika's comments around making sure that um, mental health care is highlighted. I really appreciate um, her being here and sharing that. And um, I had the pleasure of touring our wonderful uh, Raleigh-Durham Airport Authority this week, well, last week, I should say, and I just want to highlight, also note that um, we actually added another sub-direct, I guess, well, um, like seven direct flights with Spirit Airlines, and so we're really um, beefing up our airline um, services in the area. I want to make sure folks are noting, and make sure you sign up for those discounts. And um, I, want to, I want to make sure I make a special pause to say that uh, we're celebrating our 50 year of celebrating the Bimbe Festival, and I think it's important to make sure that people know uh, all of next week will be all, a lot of active activities and events and cultural arts at, um, activities that you should be able to attend. And so I look forward to enjoying that as much as possible, and hopefully you will as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other announcements by members of the council? All right, thank you. I'm going to, there's one other announcement. Uh, I'm going to ask Julie Garrett of the Recovery Center of the U.S. Small Business Administration. Ms. Garrett, uh, Ms. Garrett is here, as you all know. Um, you, everyone here is, of course, very aware of the explosion that took place in downtown Durham recently. Uh, Ms. Garrett is here uh, to talk to us a little bit about the Recovery Center. Ms. Garrett, we're glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I love your city. It's so beautiful. I've really enjoyed being here the last few days. So I'm a public affairs specialist for the Office of Disaster Assistance with the Small Business Administration, and that office is in Atlanta. And the reason I'm here is we have a business recovery center set up at the Chesterfield building in Suite 203, where businesses that were impacted by the explosion, they didn't have to be physically damaged, they just could see a drop in their business or being, you know, they're economically stressed by the disaster. We have economic injury disaster loans up to $2 million that um, Durham County businesses are eligible to apply for. And I, you have the information in your packet, the interest rate is really low, it's 4%. And there's a lot of favorable terms, um, up to 30 years and no fees. And I'm just encouraging anybody who knows anyone who has a business and has been impacted, who would like to come and ask us questions or get help, we'll be there till Thursday at 4 o'clock. We're in Suite 203. It's open 8.30 to 5. And you actually have until um, January 30th to apply for these loans. But we'll be here to help you with the paperwork through Thursday. And I'm leaving paperwork in the back for people. You can also go to disasterloan.sba.gov for more information. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. We appreciate you being here and appreciate you offering assistance to our businesses that need it. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Uh, now I'm going to ask if there are any priority items uh, by the city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Good evening, everyone. No priority items this evening from the city manager's office. Thank you very much. Madam Attorney. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. It's good to be with everyone. We also have no priority items. Thank you. Madam Clerk? It's the same for me, Mr. Mayor and council. I have no items. Thank you very much. We'll now move to the consent agenda. The consent agenda can be approved by a single vote of the council. Uh, an item can be pulled from the consent agenda by any member of the public or a member of the city council, and those items will be heard at the end of the meeting. The um, consent agenda also consists of items on which the council has previously done work. I'm going to read the items on the consent agenda. Item two, sports commission reappointment. Item three, board of adjustment appointments. Item four, Durham City, Co uh, City County Environmental Affairs Board appointment. Item, I'm sorry, did I miss the, the one that we need to make the appointment on is... On GBA. Oh, I'm sorry, it's on GBA. My bad. Uh, item four, Durham City County Environmental Affairs Board reappointment. Item six, resolution recognition of the life of El Haj Malik Al Shabazz, aka Malcolm X. And there are some speakers to this item, so we will pull that item from consent. Item seven, City County Planning Department FY20 work program. Item eight, 2018 Durham Open Space and Trails Commission annual report. Item nine, 2018 Durham City County Appearance Commission annual report. 
Item 10, 2018 Board of Adjustment Annual Report, and also there's a speaker on this item. Ms. Dockery, would you like this pulled from consent? No? Oh, you're here in case there are questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, item 11, uh, 2018 Durham Environmental Affairs Board Annual Report. Item 12, 2018 Planning Commission Annual Report. Item 13, 2018 Historic Preservation Commission Annual Report. Item 14, subrecipient contract with Housing for New Hope, Inc. for rapid rehousing services. Item 15, approval of dedicated housing funds of the North Carolina Coalition to End Homelessness, NCCEH, to provide services for homelessness, coordinated entry, and homeless management information systems, HMIS planning and administration. Item 16, EB 4707B, Old Durham Chapel Hill Road, Bicycle and Pedestrian Project Supplement Agreement. Item 17, Water Regulatory Compliance Engineering Design Services Amendment Number 6 for Black and Beach, Inc. Item 18, Bid Report, March 2019. Item 19, Resolution Approving the Application to the Local Government Commission for the Issuance of Not to Exceed $263 Million Water and Sewer Utility System Revenue Bond, Antici bond Anticipation Notes. Item 20, Proposed Condemnation of Property Located at 203 South Gregson Street. Durham, North Carolina, 27701, parcel number 103295 for the American Tobacco Waterline Replacement Project. Item 22, ordinance amending section 38-21 of the city code. Item 30, street and infrastructure acceptances. Item 33, resolution in support of the Mental Health Protection Act, the Equality for All Act, and the full repeal of House Bill 2. You have heard the items on the consent agenda. Uh, with the exception of item 6, I will now accept a motion that we approve the consent agenda. Mr. Mayor, I just want to make a note sure. on item 17. On item 17? I'm sorry. On item 17, it just looks like the uh, workforce statistics aren't attached. I just want to make sure that that's... Uh, we'll, we'll ask the staff to please provide those. Thank you. All right. Uh, do I hear a motion that we approve? So move. Second. I'm looking for my clicker. Oh, thank you. All righty. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The consent agenda passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now move to the general business agenda. Uh, the first item on the general business agenda is the Housing Appeals Board appointments. Colleagues, you have a ballot at your desk. If you all could please fill out that ballot. And uh, have you got them all, Madam Clerk? All right, good. Would you like to announce the um, results? Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Council has nominated and appointed Darren Chester to serve on the Housing Appeals Board as the alternate member representing at-large. And Mr. Green remain, Mr. Green now moves up into the seat. Great. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Council Members. Um, we'll now move to item 23, 2018-19 Durham Youth Commission Annual Report. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Uh, council members and Durham community. My name is Elise Frazier. I'm the Youth Initiative Analyst for the City of Durham's Office on Youth and advisor for the Durham Youth Commission. Um, in the Office on Youth, we believe that it's not the role of adults to give voice to youth. They already have a voice. However, we do believe that it is our responsibility to ensure that young people have an opportunity to be heard and we amplify their voice. In that same vein, I am gonna step back and invite you all to welcome, join me in welcoming two Durham Youth Commissioners who will give the report themselves, Anaga Jandala and Sarah Patterson. Hello. Hi. Hello. Good evening, Mayor Shul and Council members. Thank you for the opportunity to present an annual update of the Durham Youth Commission. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that some of our slides differ 
from the ones in your packet. We had a few major events since the slides were due, and we wanted to ensure that those were included in today's presentations. We would li now like to share a bit about the commission. The Durham Youth Commission, or as we call it, the DYC, is a city-funded commission that was created in 2005 to actively involve youth in policy issues that affect them. We exist to provide civic education, leadership development, service learning opportunities, and youth engagement and empowerment for Durham youth. We are one of the 25 chartered state youth councils across the state who are part of a bigger organization called the State Youth Council. Each local state youth council is unique and provides opportunities for youth to broaden the scope of leadership in their own community. The current DYC is composed of 25 high school aged youth in grades 9 to 12 from all over Durham. Here are some of the schools represented on the current commission. Listed here are the priorities for the 2018-2019 term of the DYC and how we spent our year. We'll share about each of these during our presentation. We will first be reviewing our efforts in skill building and training. Our first meeting as the DYC was to attend racial equity training through the Racial Equity Institute. Members were invited to attend over the summer to start our year with a shared understanding of how racial inequities affect youth across the nation. During the program, youth shared their own racial experiences and were educated on how the racial injustice, excuse me, and were educated on the racial injustices in Durham and nationwide. At the Connect Ed Conference, hosted by Partners for Youth Opportunity, we took part in discussions with professionals in several career paths where they shared their journeys in life. During our Youth Empowered Solutions training, we discussed ideas of equality versus equity in terms of race. As a youth organization, we felt it was important to recognize these issues even within our own commission and began to talk about power imbalances and how we could be aware of falling into those traps. We also learned how to identify needs in a community and plan an advocacy project. In March, a few of our members attended the National League of Cities Conference in DC and met with youth delegates and local government officials from across the country. In total, over 150 youth were in attendance and three of our members were on the planning team for the Youth Delegate Conference. As part of our membership in the State Youth Council, we will now talk about some of our annual conferences. The Minigant Conference was hosted by High Point. The goal of the conference was to allocate over $6,000 in funds to several organizations who work on interesting youth problems, including Wheel of Hope and Involve Mentoring. The Team Building Conference was hosted by Raleigh. Through fellowship and exploration of the city, musical expression, and fun at the Galaxy Fun Park, we grew closer as Youth Commission members. The Spring Convention is the final conference of the year for the State Youth Councils. This is an, this is an acknowledgement of all of the successes imp and impacts the councils have made collectively. This year, we took home two awards, <coughs> receiving second place for best scrapbook and first place for best advocacy project. Woohoo! Our next priority was connecting with elected officials in Durham. This year, we hosted our first DYC retreat <laughs> with city council and county commissioners. During the event, we took part in a scavenger hunt downtown to learn more about Durham and network with the elected officials. After the yellow team was the best. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> I think the green team. Green team. Yeah, the green team won. Right. Yellow. This it was, it best, was yellow. But. <laughs> yeah, definitely. After the scavenger hunt, gold, we actually. asked this question to officials and ourselves. What is required for authentic youth engagement? The result was several great discussions that generated ideas for the following word cloud. Equity, communication, and listening being some of the most prominent items. Similar to this current update, back in December, two of our members, Rita Cabicho and Henry Cruz Reyes, gave an update to the Board of County Commissioners. These pictures are, are of their practice run that they presented to the entire DYC for feedback and the final presentation to commissioners. Our next priority was participatory budgeting, or PB. 
Along with having two members of the DYC on the PB steering committee, the DYC also helped plan and host a PB jam, which is an idea generation session. <coughs> we hosted the event at the WG Pearson Center and made space for youth to give input on how their own communities could benefit from the allotted $2.4 million. Over 50 youth ideas were submitted at this event. We also partnered with the Reva Street Rec Center, PB team, Durham Housing Authority, and Kids Voting Durham to host a community event in the Cornwallis neighborhood on May 1st for youth out of school. We talked to community members about PB voting and they were able to vote on site. Next, we'll present our advocacy project for this term. Following months of training and dialogue about youth advocacy and empowerment, we chose to focus on creating more fun and engaging platforms for youth to share their ideas and concerns with local officials. What better way to do this than a youth voice festival? In addition to connecting youth to local decision makers for roundtable conversations, we also wanted to have an opportunity for them to connect with other youth advocacy organizations so they could learn to advocate for themselves and their community. Lastly, we held space for young people to speak about their lived experiences growing up in Durham around some kind of issue that is important to them. The youth decided what that, what that meant to them, and we had a few spoken word artists, a rapper, and a ukulele player perform for everyone at the festival. We would also like to thank Kids Voting Durham and the Durham Housing Authority for being partners in planning and hosting the festival, helping us plan the advocacy project, and providing their support. We would also like to thank elected officials who were also in attendance to hear what the youth had to say. We couldn't do any of this amazing work without our amazing partners. Throughout this term, we have had the opportunity to meet with several other youth groups, including the Raleigh Youth Council, where we volunteer for their Halloween dance for differently abled people, and yes, Youth Empowered Solutions as part of our trainings. We regularly partner with the Durham County Cooperative Extension for Kids Voting Durham events, where we help kids learn more about the electoral process both locally and nationwide. In November, we participated at the Forest Hills Precinct on Election Day and helped kids who came with their parents to cast their own ballots. In partnership with the West End Community Foundation Incorporated, we also hosted our annual Peace Toys for War Toys event, co-sponsored by the North Carolinians Against Gun Violence. At this event, we encourage and promote positive social play among young children in the neighborhood by having them exchange violent toys such as guns and swords for more peaceful toys. The West End Community Center is also the host site for the Interfaith Food Shuttle, where some of us volunteer at the Mobile Market, a temporary market set up in a community where residents can go through the line and shop for food for free. During this term, we also had the opportunity to meet with exchange students from Toyoma, Japan, one of Durham's sister cities. We took part in a cultural exchange where we tried new foods and learned about each other's cultures. Here is a picture of us teaching them how to do the Cupid Shuffle. <laughs> As we wrap up, we would like to take this moment to honor our seniors. Lucy Jones, Lemma Kachab, Rita Cavicho, Miles Leathers, Ray Palmum, Sarek Patterson, John Pacillo, Jenny Uba, Jessica Uba, and Larry Ann Whitehall. We look forward to another memorable year of serving on the DYC. For those of us graduating, we would like to wish you success in your next steps and thank you for your service. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to our presentation. Awesome. Good afternoon. Awesome. Great job. Are there other members of the Durham Youth Council who are with us today? If you are, would you please stand? There they are. Thank you. Thank you, Durham Youth Commission members. You are awesome. And we really uh, are thrilled at all the things that you're doing and what a great report. Thank you all so much. Appreciate you.
Um, I'm going to go back to item one. I, although we had the paper ballots, we still need to vote on that. Uh, my apologies. This is the uh, Housing Appeals Board appointment. I'm going to uh, accept a motion that we appoint Mr. Green for the seat so and moved. Mr. Chester as the alternate. All right, so moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. And now we'll move to item 25, the 2019 first quarter crime report. Chief Davis, welcome. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening, Chief. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present the Durham Police Department's 2019 first quarter report. Tonight's report covers our department's six performance objectives, part one violent crime, part one property crime, part one index crime, clearance rates, response times to priority one calls, and staffing levels. I'll also discuss a little bit about a few highlights during the first quarter. Part one index crime is the total of part one violent crime and part one property crime. For the first quarter of this year, part one index crime was up by 16% during the first uh, three months of the year compared to the first quarter of 2018. Larcenies accounted for more than half, 61% of all reported part one crimes, which in essence made up shoplifting, thefts from autos, and other types of thefts. Reported crime dropped in one of seven part one crime categories, which was burglaries. This slide illustrates the cumulative weekly year-to-date change in part one violent crime, which is the blue line, and part one property crime, which is the red line, <coughs> between last year and this year. As you can see, both categories started in the year significantly higher than in 2018. Property crime has steadily declined towards 2018 levels as the year has progressed. Violent crime reached even with 2018 levels in early <coughs> March, as depicted on the chart but also crept and increased slightly somewhat during the remainder of the quarter and then plateaued. Part one violent crime includes reported homicides, rapes, robberies, and aggravated assaults. Part one violent crime was up in all violent crime categories during the first quarter. There was a slight increase in the number of reported aggravated assaults. The most concentrated areas for aggravated assaults were District 4 and District 1. Although robberies, aggravated assault, and Part 1 violent crime went up compared to the first quarter in 2018, they are lower than the first quarter three-year averages for those crimes. There were 12 homicides in the first quarter of 2019. There are two open homicide cases from the first quarter as well. The number of reported sexual assaults increased by nine during the first quarter, but we have no evidence to indicate that there was any type of reoccurring theme in those incidents. 45% of the rape cases reported during the first quarter occurred in 2018 or earlier. Robberies increased by 24% during the first quarter of 2019 as well. 84% of robberies were from persons. We did experience a trend of robberies against Hispanic victims, particularly in apartment complexes during the first quarter. 
We increased our visibility and directed patrols and citizen engagement in areas where these crimes were occurring and met residents in several complexes. Officers passed out crime prevention flyers in English and in Spanish, and information was provided to Spanish-speaking media outlets as well. Our Hispanic liaison officer coordinated several successful forums at Hispanic churches, apartment buildings, and we plan to continue these meetings in the future. Most of these meetings were well attended. There were 20 commercial robberies and five bank robberies. One person has been arrested and charged with four of the bank robberies, and an arrest was also made in the fifth one. The percentage of commercial robberies dropped in 2019. 16% of the robberies in the first quarter of 2019 were commercial and bank robberies. 26% of the robberies in the first quarter of 2018 were commercial bank robberies. The number of aggravated assaults from multi-victim firearm incidents dropped by 12% from 69 to 61. 31% of all aggravated assaults during the first quarter were from multi-victim firearm incidents versus 35% during the first quarter of 2018. Moving on to property crime. Part one property crime includes burglary, larceny, and motor vehicle theft. Overall, part one property crime was up by 17% in the first quarter. Burglaries continue the downward trend, particularly the same trend that we've been seeing over the past several years. They were at a 10-year low in the first quarter and were down 49% from the first quarter 10 years ago. We continue to urge citizens' engagement related to suspicious activities, and engaging in crime prevention opportunities to talk to PAC members and other types of forums. We are continuing our 9 p.m. lockup campaign, and the lockup campaign is basically telling folks to lock their doors and lock their cars. Um, and we are actually using social media for these announcements, which reminds people to take care of their property and use that as a way to try to send out messages to prevent uh, property thefts. A burglary trend we noticed this year, even though burglary uh, burglaries have been down, uh, we noticed a trend this year that 12% um, of the burglaries were burglaries to sheds. Lawn equipment was taken in many of these burglaries. We have posted notices, utilized social media, listservs, including Nextdoor, to inform residents of these trends as well. Larcenies made up 61% of our Part 1 crimes. 44% of our larcenies were from vehicles over thefts of motor vehicle <coughs> parts. 29% of larcenies were from shoplifting incidents. Investigators have arrested several people who have numerous shoplifting charges in several counties. However, misdemeanor diversion has been utilized whenever those, uh, those elements exist in those cases. Our larcenies were average during the last three months of 2018. They were below normal during the, part, uh, the start of the first quarter of 2019. They have been steadily escalating since mid-March. More than 50% of stolen vehicles were either left running or had the keys in the vehicle. It's been a common thing. The most frequently stolen vehicle, again, Honda Accords, followed by Nissan, Altimas, and Ford Explorers. Motor vehicle thefts were below normal for much of the first quarter of 2019. Moving on, the clearance rates. As you're aware, we compare our department's clearance rates to those of other departments of similar size. The FBI's um, clearance rates are used for us to um, compare our annual clearance rates. 
our target clearance rates are 23% property crime clearance and 50% violent crime clearance. Our clearance rates at the end were better than the average for cities our size in all property crime categories and homicide and robbery during the first quarter of 2019. The homicide clearance rate is at 100% at the end of the first quarter. It should also be noted that on rape clearances, almost half of our reported rapes during the first quarter were for prior years. Also, rape cases often require uh, DNA tests, and sometimes clearances come much later because it takes time to get those results back. <clears throat> Priority one calls for service. Our average response times were 5.75 minutes, which met our target of 5.8 minutes or less. The last time we met this target was the fourth quarter of 2014. We answered 56.9% of priority one calls in less than five minutes in the first quarter of 2019. This increase came very close to meeting our 57% target. In the next few months, we should have enough data uh, to determine if our our beat adjustments and our beat realignment has really been beneficial uh, as it relates to response times and calls for service. Utilizing patrol officers um, during supplemental has um, been helpful in increasing visibility and adding to the um, response time numbers as well. Recently, we've adjusted our supplemental staffing to deploy more officers during times when we have peak calls. Staffing at the end of the first quarter 2019, as of March 31st, our sworn staff was at 98% at the end of March. Our non-sworn staffing was at 97% at the end of March. This has been the highest that um, our civilian staff has been in many years as well. 24 recruits graduated from our BLET number 48 class during the first quarter. We currently have 27 recruits in our basic law enforcement training. Academy number 49, this academy is scheduled to graduate this summer. And we are continuing to test applicants for our BLET number 50, which is scheduled to start in August. We also continue to hire in our ALET program where we are transferring lateral officers from other agencies. Our U visa requests. Our U visa program continues to receive application requests. The Durham Police Department processed 51 U visa requests during the first quarter of 2019. 65% were approved. We're seeing fewer applications from previous years and plan to expand the time frame more as our processing levels continue to decrease. Just a little bit of information about internal restructuring. We conducted um, a bit of restructuring in the police department in January to enhance the efficiency and create a more equitable administrative workload amongst our key command staff members. To accomplish this, we added a new deputy chief position who oversees the investigative services division. We split the patrol bureau under two majors. One is in charge of district one, two, and three and the other is in charge of District 4, 5, and Special Project. <coughs> These majors report to the Deputy Chief of Field Operations. The third Deputy Chief oversees administrative services, which includes personnel, training, fiscal, and other administrative support functions. The rank of Assistant Chief was changed back to Major. This reestablished the pyramid structure of the organization and maintains a clear delineation of roles in the department.
March, of course, was International Women's Month. We held our third annual Eagle Award celebration on March 15th. Many of you attended, and thank you uh, for your support in that um, affair. The Eagle Award honors women who represent excellence in leadership achievement and gallantry in law enforcement. Six women, investigators and officers, received Eagle Crime Fighter Awards. Captain Denise Campbell was Supervisor of the Year. Two women received Sister-in-Law Awards, more of mentoring types of uh, recognition and support. Attorney Karen Bethea Shields was awarded the Trailblazer Commendation. She became the first female elected as a judge in North Carolina's 14th District and the second African-American female judge in North Carolina in 1980. During the month of March, we participated in several panel discussions around the Triangle area and in celebration of Women History Month. And that concludes my report. I would like to say thank you to Council and to Mayor Shul and City Administration during the explosion a few weeks ago. Um, with the help of the great leadership of our fire chief, Chief Zoloff, we were able to really work Zoldos. well together. Zoloff? Zoldos. 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 Uh, we were able to work really closely together to help mitigate, but it made a difference to see the city come together the way they, the way they did on that day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Uh, I wanted to uh, say we have Chief Cates and Chief Assembly here. And it was good to see you all uh, as our deputies, uh, along with Chief Marsh. Uh, congratulations to you. And we know that we, we know you. We've seen you all at work over a long period of time and admire you and really appreciate your, your, your uh, ascension to the leadership. So it's great. Thank you. Uh, we have a number of speakers, but I think before we do that, I'm going to ask if uh, we can uh, if there are questions from members of the council, and then uh, we'll go to the speakers, or any comments from members of the council at this point. Uh, Councilmember Austin. Yeah, just a couple points of clarification. Thank you, Chief, for your report. <clears throat> you mentioned the multi-victim firearm incidents. I just missed the number. I don't know if the total number? That. Yeah, just the total number. Let me go back to it. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Council Member, I'm going to dig through my notes. No I don't problem. Have that no number. Problem. I think yeah. I have percentages. You want to take a minute? Um, okay, but I can get you that information. Sure. Um, and just another question. Um, you mentioned the rate of robberies um, in our Latinx community and, and involving apartment complexes. Yes. And I wanted to just, I guess, even anecdotally, are they are they accompanying? Are the robberies also also involving home invasions typically, or are they? Like, what's kind of the nature of... Mostly parking lot. Parking lot. And that's what we've been talking about. Um, our community members just being very cognizant of their surroundings. Most of these robberies have occurred while um, individuals are coming and going, either coming home from work or going to work in the parking lots. Okay. Of course, we've had a few that had other characteristics to them as well but we've been very focused on apartment complexes and the parking lot robberies to try to curtail some of that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And just whenever you find that number. I will. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Other questions or comments at this point? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem and then Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Chief, for your report. Yes. Um, I just had a couple clarifying questions. On the third slide of your presentation, there's a graph that we see in every report, and I just still don't completely understand what it's trying to communicate. It's the year-to-date change, 2018 to 2019, cumulative by week. Yes. What is What are we meant to understand from this visual? Well, that particular visual basically just captures the percentage of whether, and it doesn't, it doesn't depict the numbers, but it, it sort of depicts the percentage of crime being up or down. Say, for instance, in the, as I mentioned earlier, around the first week of March, it was kind of at zero. 
which meant we were right where we were uh, last year this time. And it helps us to determine whether or not we're moving up or down as it relates to the percentages. After the first of the year, as you can see, compared to last year's numbers, we were up about 40, 40%, 45% of how much. Right, but those numbers are so small that I don't know that they're really meaningful. I see what you're saying. Well, and we, we also, um, I did receive the, and I'm sure Council Member Reese may have some comments about it, the annual numbers typically do shed um, a broader or more vivid picture of crime trends and um, just that particular email will give us cause to, to go back and really talk about how we can present the numbers so that they make sense to this body. Particularly since we're just talking about quarters, comparing a snapshot from this year to last year, most crime data is captured annually anyway. Um, Durham is a little unique that we do a quarterly report but it doesn't mean that we can't capture annual numbers as well. Um, it gives the impression that there's a lot going on when you're just uh, capturing just one, you know, 30-day mm -hmm. snap, I mean, 90-day snapshot. So expanding it throughout a 12-month period really lets you see whether or not the numbers are really um, peaking or, you know, or we're in a good place. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So. So on this particular graph, for example, the, the last numbers on it, 10.9%, does that mean that we're 10.9% higher for the year we're... higher than the previous year? That's right. <coughs> I'm sorry that that graph may have been confusing. Yeah, I always find it a little bit confusing and just not, um, I'm just never really sure like what how how it how it communicates meaning i guess like what it means well from day to day uh we, of course we pay attention to it from day to day and week to week we talk about it so that as it's edging in one direction or the other we we began to deploy resources so we talk about it and really kind of know what it means not saying that that um nobody else really understands it but because we're in it every day <laughs> we sort of know that those 10 percent and those five percents mean something to us. It means right. for us to try to stay on top of it. But it can be illustrated in a different way so that it conveys um, more of where we are over a 12-month period has been suggested and whether we're up compared to uh, the 12 months prior. Or even the three-year average or something like that. I think it's just the, the previous year to this year isn't um, I just think it's not as useful a, me a measurement as like a broader sort of trend analysis. And we can do that because we capture the three years to um, moving from, from one year to the next. It's important for us to know that we're moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we've looked at the data from 2016, 17, and 18 to see, you know, how those, how those months um, compare. And it does have a a different meaning mm -hmm. when you look at it that way. Thank you. Um, and I had just one more question. On page four of your report for first quarter part two crime, um, again, you know, as it's just the first, first quarter, this may level off over the course of the year, but I noticed that for 2019, that drug violations had nearly doubled from the previous two years. Um, we had 144 in 2017, 150 in 2018, and 295 in 2019. And I was wondering if you had a sense of why that's the case. Um, and the, the long explanation has to do with NIBRS reporting. We, we sat down and talked about that. That was glaring for me, too. But we have a new reporting requirement through the NIBRS reporting, and it is that we have to report all all numbers of, of these types of violations as opposed to those that are or a certain amount. So as we're reporting, especially as we started at the beginning of the year, this quarter is showing a large difference. Um, I, would, I would suggest that we sit down and talk about the whole new NIBRS reporting too because it's, it's quite involved. Could you, what is NIBRS? I just I'm sorry. It's the new um, 
national incident reporting system that all agencies around the country have to utilize. Okay. We're shifting from UCR reporting to NIBRS. And we talked about possibly doing a presentation in work session so that um, this body would understand that we're having to report differently now and, and much more information mm -hmm. than we have in the past. Okay. But we'll be glad to drill down and help explain that. That would be, yeah, that would be really helpful. I just want to make sure it that stood we're out not, to me too. Yeah, arresting more people for drugs. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to also on this um, sheet, wanted to appreciate that we didn't arrest anyone for solicitation in the first quarter. Um, and I'm hopeful that those folks will continue to be diverted for um, treatment and other services rather than arrested. And, and that's what our officers are, are trying to do. We get a lot of calls yeah. uh, from community members, but the first effort is to provide assistance, um, you know, uh, especially those individuals that are willing to accept assistance. So um, our CF Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Councilmember Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Chief. It's always good to see you. Thank you. Um, as you know, and you, you alluded to this, so let me explain a little bit about what you were talking about and then ask you a question about it. Um, one of the things that, one of the frustrations I've had for a long time about the way that we report crime numbers here in Durham is that we do year-to-date figures at the end of each quarter. And for the fourth quarter report, that's a great way to do it uh, because by then there are four quarters of data to report. You've got a whole year. Um, you can easily compare that to other years, and that's a good uh, comparator. But this first quarter report um, of each calendar year is the shortest reporting period. It's just three months of data. And as a result, those numbers are often the swingiest or the most volatile of all of our quarterly crime reports. Um, and uh, with that in mind, I prepared <laughs> what I hope is a mathematically accurate graph um, that I sent to my colleagues this afternoon, along with you and the city manager, um, the, that is the model of something that I think we might want to try to look at from here on out. And instead, of that, that is in the, at the end of each quarter, don't look at just the data from the beginning of the year to the end of that quarter. So not just one quarter and then two quarters and three quarters of data. But at every quarterly crime report, also let us see the last previous 12 months of crime data so that we can see for each quarter what the previous 12 months looked like. And I think that will tend to smooth out some of the seasonality that can get, creep into these numbers mm -hmm. because each 12 months obviously has each season in it um, and each month. Um, and I think what you see when you look at the data that way um, with respect to this quarter is that we, um, that for the last 12 months, we've actually had fewer violent crimes than we had at the end of the first quarter of 2018 um, because at the, at, the, at the end of the first quarter of 2018, that includes three quarters of 2017 data, which were a much higher crime period. Um, all of which is to say, to reinforce what my colleague, the Mayor Pro Tem said, which is the, these relatively small numbers as compared to the, to the 12 month data can lead to some misleading conclusions about what's actually happening in our community. And I just wanted to commend that to your attention the next time you prepare one of these reports. Obviously I should have gotten on the ball about this a couple of months ago, because it could have been in this report, but. I wonder if you would just um, share your thoughts about kind of looking at the data that way instead of the way we've been doing it. I totally agree. Most police agencies don't capture crime data in a 90-day period. That snapshot doesn't give you an accurate account of, of, of trends. So um, even though we have to report year-to-date data, most year-to-date data is... Um, reported on an annual basis. So at the end of the year, the police department goes and does their annual crime report, so to speak. And that's for a 12-month period. Most of the time it's a calendar year during the 12-month period. But because um, we conduct a quarterly report, then we would probably create a report that captures 12 months from the quarter. It does give a more uh, accurate and more vivid um, picture of where crime trends are 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 going, and um, I, I got your email. I didn't get a chance to cross check your math, but um, well, fingers crossed. 
But um, um, I, I totally agree. Um, what we'll do is we'll talk to the staff because they still have to report crime, UCR, NIBRS, uh, crime year to date the way they are. We would just have to um, capture that data so that we can look at it, the window of next quarter's report. If it's in um, August, then we'll be looking at 12 months of data from August, and that might um, help <coughs> satisfy that, that, that particular issue. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. One other question I wanted to raise um, before we got to the, some of the citizen comments is that back at the end of March, um, I, you and I uh, were emailing uh, along with the city manager about the 2018 traffic stop data. Um, I'm wondering if uh, when you get back to the police department, if you might take a look at um, sending that data to us. Um, I think this is around the time of the year when we should normally get that or maybe a little after. So Absolutely. You let us see that that'd be great. That report was um, completed this past Thursday. Perfect. And um, and it's already been sent to the HRC. Um, it just posted to the web, it's on the website. Great. You're good. Yeah. And we could do it at a <coughs> And, um, the way we had Jason to present before on it. If, if you That'd wish. be perfect. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate it. Sure. That's all I had for now, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Freeman. I, I get you, Mike. Yeah, it's absolutely fine. Thank you. I, I actually wanted to ask a question. You mentioned the diversion. Well, Council, I'm sorry, Mayor Pro. Ms. Mina Diversion? Mentioned the, the capture. Well, I just wanted to know how the data was captured regarding who was. Diverted. Um, I'm not sure if you're. We have that a, or not, but. That, that's another report that we um, compile. It's not included here because um, it, it too was was just completed. We have a complete misdemeanor diversion um, report. It captures the various types of cases um, that were misdemeanor cases, the individuals, how many were actually diverted to um, the misdemeanor diversion program through Durham County Court. And then I also wanted to ask, uh, when you're talking about the the data comparing year to date, I just wanted to know if you were using that to chart staffing at all. Well, we use we absolutely use our data, not just year to date, but um, we use we use our our data on a on a daily basis to help deploy where officers should be assigned. And I think that the. Any, in, in that instance, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to make clarification in my own mind. But um, can you tell me when the next meeting is for where you do the stats reporting again? That'll be Thursday morning. Third, say it again. Thursday, Thursday morning. morning. Thursday morning. Thursday morning at 9 o'clock okay. at police headquarters. We're talking about the CAP meeting. Thank you. Can I report it? Thank you. And I... Uh, and it, you noted there were some beat adjustments and, al and alignment changes. Have any of them been around hours per day? As far as? For officers. As far as for officers, no, hours are, are the same. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, colleagues, and good evening to everyone in the chamber. Chief, good to see you. And to the command staff present, always good to see you. You, you, might have, you may have the toughest job in Durham. So I uh, appreciate uh, you. the way you, you go about doing it. I, um, I, want, I want to associate myself with, with the comments uh, of my colleague, uh, Councilor Reese, and with you, Chief, about um, the statistical integrity or perhaps best practices of reporting statistics on a yearly basis as opposed to a quarterly basis. But insofar as that's the way we've been doing it, I, I think for transparency's sake, for folk at home watching and listening, I. I I feel I should just say, you know, we, we didn't have a problem taking victory laps when the numbers were good on a quarterly basis. And that probably would have been a better time to talk about the expanded view of yearly uh, reporting. Um, and I think that's a better way to do it. I want to say that. But, um, you know, so, so I just want to own that for folk watching at home who have been accustomed to us doing it that way, these numbers may be a bit sobering. Um, but the year's not over. Uh, from a statistical point of view. But it does, however, I think, give us an on-ramp to, to talk about how non-compelling the argument is to folk who are victims of crime and who live in neighborhoods that are, are, um, are facing 
um, quality of life issues. They, they just don't find the, the statistical discussion very compelling. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to talk about, ask you, Chief, about a phenomena that you know about far better than me that does not get captured in our reporting, um, namely gunfire that goes unreported uh, in many communities. And um, I appreciate uh, the report. I, I want to ask you, Chief, we, we had a uh, presentation on a shot spotter some time ago, and I know that you're in uh, budgetary deliberations, but are, are you in a position to give us any sense as to how um, probable that our police department will be asking for that technology uh, during this budget cycle? Can you give us any sense of, of, of whether or not that's coming? Well, we have been in discussions about Shot Spotter and um, looking at all of the specs, looking at the costs uh, to the department, to the city. Um, not just that, looking at uh, the resources that might be needed to support it. Um, and in the discussions that we've had, uh, we just feel like any tool <coughs> to help us um, curtail, if not for just the, the, the psychological factor that um, this particular system is set up could, could act as a deterrent. So we have um, absolutely been in discussion about the potential to, to get shot spotter technology and really have talked about it for um, several months now. And I know this is something that you have also been involved in as far as sitting in on some of our presentations and discussions. But the discussions have gone uh, beyond just um, the fact that the Durham Police Department thinks it'd be a great tool. We've, we've also thought about the impact and listening to um, other you know, members of council about what that impact might be to um, our community members and sometimes lack of understanding and not really um, understanding or getting information about what the tool will actually do sometimes skews um, the perception of, of the actual tool itself. Mm -hmm. it, it captures gunfire and it creates an opportunity for um, officers to be able to respond to a quality of life issue, even when there's no one who's been struck by it, to be able to say, is everybody okay? We got a report that there's gunfire here. Um, right now, not just here in Durham, but in many cities, gunfire goes on on a regular basis and people just kind of hit the deck. And sometimes police don't come out because they're not called, because people become uh, normalized to a gunfire sometimes, and that's, that's sad to say. But I will say that the conversation has been active with the city manager. We have been in long discussions about it, and um, we, we just know that there are various types of um, obstacles sometimes. Um, of course, the say isn't for me, but right. definitely would like to evaluate anything that will help us as it relates to violent crime and gunfire. Council Member, if I could interrupt. Sure. So we're, we're doing council member briefings on the budget recommendations this week, I think beginning tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that's on our schedule to speak with council members about. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Manager. And, and thank you for the, um, for, for the, the measured um, response and well-crafted response. I, I, I got to tell you, Chief, personally, um, I think this is one of those issues that we should be leading on. Um, I think this is one of those issues uh, and if you look over the recent history of this council, the council as an institution's involvement, be it um, uh, uh, written consent, be it uh, uh, implicit bias training, I think there are moments when um, certain things need to be led on and certain things need to be tasked to the administration rather than waiting for a recommendation. I think this is one of those moments, and, I, and I, I'm glad to hear that the conversations are going forward. Uh, and I just want to, for the record, state, and just for whatever it's worth, that however those conversations go, if for whatever, and I know you're a manager, so you've got to look at resources and prioritize ask. And because an ask may not be on the list doesn't necessarily mean that you don't think it's important, but you have limited resources, and as a manager, you're mindful of that. I, I want to honor all of that. But I think, with respect to this issue, if it does not make the list, uh, I want to say to my colleagues very directly that I think this is one of those issues that rises to the level of leadership on our part, uh, that we should make this happen as we've made other things happen. Um, I don't know how many people were killed on bikes 
uh, in traffic last year. And I know that one is one too many, but I do know that we're moving to put protected, uh, barrier protected bike barriers in the city. Um, there was no science that suggested that uh, tire mulch was endangering our children in East Durham Park, but the parents felt that they were, and we acted. This is, I think, uh, one of those moments, another one of those times when we need to act, notwithstanding uh, any recommendations that come from staff. And, and I think we've more than demonstrated our willingness to do this. Um, this is one of those moments, I think. So I want to encourage uh, and thank the manager for the continued conversations. But however those conversations go, I want to respectfully submit that this council should be prepared to act and demonstrate uh, to people in this city uh, that we take this issue as seriously as we do trees and, and bikes and tire mulch, uh, and that we, when it comes to certain people in certain neighborhoods, will go beyond making speeches and platitudes uh, and dissertations about root causes and spend some money. And if it doesn't work, we can cancel it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Any other, any other, any other comments, council members? Any questions or comments? Council member Caballero? Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, Thank you to you and the police for the last quarter. I have been at many of the events that you have held in predominantly Latino uh, community spaces, either in neighborhoods or at churches. I want to particularly thank Officer Ramos, who um, has stepped in and um, really just done a phenomenal job uh, trying to engage folks. Uh, I am heartened to hear that you're open about your U visa policy. You know I will continue to ask for it. Um, I appreciate that it did get moved back to 2011. I like I like the, I like the movement that I'm seeing. Uh, you know, I want the limit to just be open ended, but I do appreciate that you um, are acknowledging on your end that things are moving quicker, and that hopefully we will have a no time limit soon. Thank you. Um, and with that said, I I can use this forum just to let you know um, part of the incremental spread was really just so that we could we could manage it and um, over the last three months or so even after we changed it to 2011 we we have begun to see fewer cases and we talked about that a little bit and um, we are expanding it I just need a little time to change Thank the you. general order <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we we will and we will continue to co communicate to um, the community and I do believe that we will probably um, take in I would say in the next six months anybody who has a request left out there because they're becoming fewer and fewer so I thought I'd use this as an opportunity to do that thank you chief that is a uh, very glorious news to hear thank you Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Council Member. Any other questions or comments by members of the Council at this point? Council Member Freeman? Just a question. I'm, I'm just thinking out loud, essentially. But do you think that the U visa numbers might have some tie to the way in which the Latino engagement and outreach and all of this is working to make sure that folks are reporting the actual crimes and maybe this is why this number is up? Um, well, I, I think that we've made some inroads as it relates to the willingness to report crimes and su support the investigations of crimes. Having bilingual officers and individuals sort of boots on the ground, Councilmember Javier has um, been very helpful in helping to bridge that gap as well. Um, having the, the number of officers that we have that are bilingual is amazing for a department this size. So anytime we bring uh, officers and they typically come in plain clothes, um, you might see a few in uniform that are at work, uh, to be able to have conversation and to have the number of officers who are, who are bilingual and literally have conversations with uh, individuals at those meetings, I think it really helps. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chief. Um, appreciate it. Um, I want to also thank you for your uh, continual progress on the U visas. I think it's very important to all of us and much appreciate the way you've taken it on. Uh, and I'm glad to hear that uh, you think in the next six months we'll be able to lift the time limit. Uh, and that, that's a, you, you've really made great strides on that and I much appreciate it. Um, this was a tough quarter. 
we, was. the, the, um, I think that there, to me, there are two things going on. One is, last year was, in, statistically, uh, an extraordinary year in terms of uh, our, our crime numbers in Durham. We had exceptionally low property crime numbers in some categories, the lowest crime uh, in 20 some years mm -hmm. uh, in some major categories. And our violent crime was also down significantly, especially in the first quarter last mm -hmm. year. Yep. So in com compared to last year, uh, as I, when we were talking about those good numbers last year, as Councilmember Middleton said, we were happy to celebrate it, and rightly so. But uh, as we did, you uh, continually reminded us that um, those were not always going to be the quarters that we were going to have, and we had a tough quarter. Uh, I think especially our homicides, I think, were very distressing to all of us, and I know they were. Uh, to everybody in the department, to everybody in the community. And every time, you know, each of these gunshot, whether it's a, whether it's a wound or a homicide, um, is just terribly damaging to all of us. And we know how incredibly important the work that you all do is, and we really appreciate it and we support it. Um, our, um, I, I know that the, you know, this is the thing about a quarterly crime reporting. It goes up and down. We know that our trend over the last 20 years is like this, but it's not straight like that. It's like this, it's like this, it's like this, and we're in one of these quarters. And so I'm very hopeful that with the good police work we continue to do, but also with the support of the community in so many ways, uh, that we'll be able to bring this down again next quarter. And I, I really want to emphasize that, that that this can't be the job that just we expect our police to do, that we all have got to be pitching in, uh, that the work that you all do to win the trust of communities is critically important, and uh, you've done so much of it uh, in recent years, and I know that our community will respond. So I just want to appreciate you and uh, appreciate the work of the department. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to now ask, we have a number of speakers and I'm going to now ask for those speakers, and then we may have uh, more comments from members of the council. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Um, we have, let me count the number. We have 11 speakers. I'm going to give each speaker three minutes, and I would like the speakers, as I call your name, I'm We'll call the first group, if you'd please line up over here to my right. Uh, we'll start with Mr. James Chavis, followed by Ms. Victoria Peterson. Followed by Ms. Jackie Wagstaff, followed by Mr. Abdul Burnett, followed by Mr. Rob Belcher. If you all could please line up over here to my right, and uh, Mr. Chavis, uh, welcome. Please give us your name and address, and you have three minutes. Good afternoon, I mean, good evening. I wish to thank you, Mayor, and the council for giving Mr. me Mr. Chavis, could you speak into the mic a little bit more? I'm having a hard time hearing you, thank you. Okay, thank you. I have Jackie to give me this information. My name is James Chavis, I stay at 2813 Ash Street in Durham, North Carolina. I'm also the PAC co-facilitator, and the information I'm giving you is the incident that happened at our Y.E. Y. Smith Bull City event Saturday, okay? As you know or may not know, that to my knowledge, and I've been doing this for 10 years with the Driver Street Bull City Open School Club, once we closed those streets with barricades, no cars are supposed to come through there. And to my knowledge, no one's supposed to have permission to allow a car to come through there. Well, Saturday, I put my own life in jeopardy because I stood in front of the car was trying to get by to go up. I didn't know why to come through and found out that your captain of your uh, fire department gave the lady permission to drive her car through our barricade and once we closed it. 
And we had a conversation about that, and one of the guys asked me to stop and step back. And he stepped in front of me and let the car go on up there. My question to you all, as you read this and see, I'm calling for a meeting so this can be discussed openly because a lot of people at that event asked me, how did this happen? Because I was in charge of being one of the ones outside to make sure safety goes to all and not just one. Okay? I know I'm being quick because I only got three minutes. But I wish each and every one of you would come out, read this, and got in the question to ask me about your captain. And I put his name in there to let you know who I'm talking about because we changed information that he told me he did not know the rules and regulations of our events and what's supposed to be following. And if one child or someone that got hit, every last one of y'all would been looking at us, the volunteers, and the, uh, the staff that was in charge of that event. Because somehow that car was not supposed to have been there. So I need you all to come at this forum to talk to us about this event openly to the public, because I cannot say that this should have happened, but it did. And as you know, in June, the third Saturday in June, we once again will be having our Bull City Open Street Festival, and you sure know we never had any problems like this. All right? Thank you, Mr. Chavis. I don't, the first I've heard about it, I'll be glad to look at the material and follow up with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Thank you, Mr. Chavis. Victoria Peterson. I don't see Ms. Peterson here right now. Uh, Ms. Jackie Wagstaff. <coughs> Ms. Wagstaff, welcome. Please give us your name and address. You have three minutes. Um, Jacqueline Wagstaff, Durham. Um, Mr. Mayor, council members. I really was not going to speak, but this weekend was just horrible. Um, we had 14 murders in the month of Fort, in the month of April, higher than all of last year. A.J. Lipskin, father of three girls, uh, recently released from prison but was working three jobs, the latest murder on Linwood. That was the murder that happened at 1040 Saturday night. Three murders in one Saturday. That was just murders, but we had a couple of shootings during the day. At 340, there was a gentleman that was shot. This is too often. This is happening too much. I, I dare to say that I actually agree with Pastor Middleton over there about you, the way you appropriate your funds and how you look at things now in Durham. It was brought to my attention that there were council members that said that the older population, we're antiquated and our ideas are not relevant to solutions now and we need to be listening to the millennials. But we are the ones that understand what goes on in the community. We know these victims by name. We know the people that are creating the problems in the community by name. We're the ones that understand these streets but we're the ones that are never at the table when y'all are having this discussion about what are we going to do about these problems. You cherry pick the people that you bring in to have these discussions. Most of the time, those people have no relationship to the community other than being black. That's it. But when it comes down to knowing what's going on in these streets, the people that you want to put push it aside because we may be a little antiquated and we may think a little differently because we do have a little age, We've been out here in these streets a long time. We understand this community. I've looked at a lot of these people that now I can't look at anymore. I've watched them grow up in these schools of Durham. I looked at, I went to three events. Thank you, Councilwoman Freeman, for coming to an event Saturday. But I went to three events Saturday. And mostly every one of those events, I spoke with guys that I've seen grow up from kindergarten to now. And I know they're involved in the criminal justice system. And every one of them, I ask them the same question every time they see me. 
How are you doing? Are you staying out of trouble? And they always tell me the same thing. I'm trying to stay out of trouble. Do you know where I can get a job? One of the things I do know about Durham and this population and this crime problem we have, this housing situation that we have of not having any is, is directly involved in this crime. You show me a person that doesn't have a secure housing, I'm going to show you a person that's going to commit a crime and some more. Thank you, Ms. Wagstaff. Mr. Abdul Burnett. Mr. Burnett, welcome. Please give us your name and address, and you have three minutes. <coughs> Abdul Burnett, 512 North Hart Street, Durham, North Carolina. Hmm. I'm part of SKU, which is Stop Killing Us and Justice Minister. Mr. Burnett, pull just a little bit farther back from the mic. Yeah, there you go. Um, we'll be on the streets fighting. in the streets, right? Nobody else is out there, right? So you have to figure. We talked to the families of people that had lost people due to gun violence, right? So that's our focus. Our focus also is building a better Durham, right? But when you talk about building a better Durham, when I ride through the city of Durham, I ride through a city with huge buildings. I ride past the police headquarters downtown across from a community, a housing development community, right? When we talk about these things, we talk about pushing people in the streets, right? With that money and all those billions and billions of dollars, that could have been used for our communities, putting resources inside our communities to help people to reform themselves. Instead, it's a push out. To me, me personally, I don't think the number's right on murders. Honestly. To be exact. I mean, I know y'all tired, I'm tired, I'm fed up. We be on the grounds consistently in the communities. Oxford Manor and they had some shootings out that way, right? So when a shot fire thing come out, is the officer gonna respond in time enough? I've done been out there when it have been shots fired and it take an officer a long time to get out there. That's not good. So what are we gonna do about that problem? Next problem is, Us being in the community, trying to build the community, establishes a lot for us because we work with the young youth very closely and we love our kids out there. And um, if we could rebuild our communities and pull our communities together, then we would see a better Durham with the people of Durham not being afraid to go talk to the people of Durham that live in the city of Durham, that live in the public housing development in the city of Durham. The citizens should have decision makings too. You know, I mean, I think and I truly believe that if we build that community and if we build that village, then we can raise all our kids. That's my concern. Thank you very much, Mr. Burnett. We'll now hear from Mr. Rob Belcher. Mr. Belcher here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Welcome, and please give us your name and address. You have three minutes. Rob Belcher. <clears throat> Rob Belcher, 4328 Timberstone Road, Durham. Hello to the chair, everybody up there, mayor. City of Durham. My name is Rob Belcher. I'm with a Chance to Change organization. Uh, we're a fairly new organization, and uh, I definitely want to come out saying I'm definitely an advocate for the, the shot spotter. I'm saying that because uh, we had a 13-year-old get shot in uh, McDougal Terrace on last Monday. So they're at the park. The kids are at the park. About 80 kids at the park. There's a shooting. Got guys shooting on this side, shooting at each other. One kid got hit. A couple kids got grazed. So if we had a spot shotter, it would be able to show the police, okay, 
it came from here, it came from there. Because when you come to the neighborhood, everyone knows, every, nobody's seen anything. And I know the police are tired of dealing with that. Oh, I ain't seen nothing, I ain't seen nothing. But the spot shot is not going to be an issue. The spot shot is going to tell what it saw. So that won't be a problem. So I say, we got $2.4 to get it, let's get it. If we got a probationary period that we can go through and see if it works, then let's jump on it. We're playing with people's lives. We ain't going to say we're playing with their lives. I'm saying their lives at stake. Also, uh, if the chief needs some policemen, it's in the budget. I saw the budget. Let's get them. If she needs 72, let's get a 72. I don't understand the waiting three years. I don't understand that part, but we need what we need. We don't. There, in three years, if, if we if we giving her 20 here, 30 there, 40, well, let's give her what she needs. We're fighting a war. We need what we need to win. So I'm I'm asking, I'm proposing, I'm totally behind. Let's get the shot spotter and let's get the officers. Along with having the officers, I'm asking that we can have the officers more boots on the ground. Like I said the last time I spoke, just having boots on the ground, seeing these police walk around, um, it, it just... It, it pretty much what we call on the street, make the, it, made, it made the situation hot. Nobody wants to be doing crime and the police are walking around all the time. Uh, everybody's hip to a police car sitting there and it's empty, okay? Uh, even during the shooting, uh, the police were off work that day in the MAC. I, I don't know how that happened, but they off on Monday. So even with the schedule in, in, in MacDougal Terrace, there's a time where there's no one there and there's a substation actually in MacDougal so I'm saying all that to say I'm, I'm behind. Let's get those officers for the chief. Let's get that shot spotter. Let's get the ball rolling. We got 2.4 million. We have it. Let's make it happen. Um, and, and lastly, also, I was going to say uh, for a lot of construction going on, it's a lot of these crimes going on because these people don't have money. And there's a lot of these people from out of town funding these projects. I think we should have them to where they have to hire some of the people from Durham to actually build, to work on that construction site. Uh, that should be one of the criteria, and that's that's all. I'm done, Chief. Thank you very much, Mr. Belcher. Yes, we sir. appreciate you being here. Yes, sir. No problem. All right. Uh, our next speaker is, I believe, this is uh, Monica Rosa, and I believe we have some interpretation. If Ms. Rosa needs interpretation. Buenas noches. Buenas noches para todos. Ya todos conocen el grupo de las Visa U. Mi nombre es Mónica Rosa. Ante todo quisiera dar las gracias por esta nueva oportunidad de podernos expresar el día de hoy. Good evening. My name is Mónica Rosa and you all know about the subject of Visa uh, One, Visa U, and mm -hmm. um, I wanted to start by introducing. Ok. Um, Gracias a la jefa de policía por haber hecho otro cambio más. La verdad es muy importante porque más víctimas podemos tener la oportunidad de aplicar. Pero también sepan que no nos vamos a rendir hasta que no se quiten las restricciones. So thank you to the chief of police uh, for her report, knowing that more victims will be able to apply. But also please know that we won't stop until the restrictions are taken away. La lucha sigue. Todos queremos un cambio. Verdad, no solo de la visa U, sino un cambio en general. Queremos comunidades seguras. Tenemos que luchar juntos para, lograr, para lograrlo. The fight continues. We all want to change. We want safe communities, and we all have to fight to achieve this. Y es por eso que tenemos que hacerlo juntos. No tendremos una tarjeta verde, pero eso no nos hace la diferencia. And we have to fight together. We may not have a green card, but that, that shouldn't make the difference. Podemos luchar codo a codo, mano a mano. Gracias por la oportunidad y arriba la visa aún y comunidades seguras. So we have, we can fight elbow to elbow, hand to hand. So let's continue with, or we should all cheer for visa, uh, you and safety communities. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you very much, Ms. Rosa. And now we will hear from Margarita Ocampo. Buenas noches a todos. 
Este, gracias. yo les quiero dar las gracias porque ya me firmaron mi certificación de la DISAU y les quiero agradecer a todos los que me apoyaron. Y claro, que este, yo sé que es un proceso muy largo, pero también quiero pedir que, ay, perdón. So good good evening everyone. Thank you. Um, I want to thank all of you because uh, my certification of visa U was signed. Okay, y también quiero pedir que quiten las restricciones porque claro, hay más gente, más víctimas como yo que también necesitan un, una visa o bueno, un apoyo. So I want to ask for the restrictions to be taken away because there are more people like me that need support, that need this visa. Es todo, gracias. That's all, thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Ocampo, and congratulations. Gracias, señor Ocampo, y felicitaciones. Our next uh, speaker, uh, the only name I see here is Fide. El único nombre que veo aquí es Fide. Fide? No? Okay. Oh, okay. Hello, could you give us your name and address, please? Nos puedes dar tu nombre y dirección, por favor. Mi nombre es Fidelina Moreno. Um, yo fui víctima de asalto agravado. Yo, mis niñas y mi, mi esposo, um, les quiero dar las gracias, ¿verdad? Porque a mí me firmaron la certificación. Pero igual como a mí, uh, que he pasado ansiedad con estrés, por miedo, por el trauma que hemos vivido, uh, si de favor a otros compañeros que no han podido firmarles si nos podrían ayudar <coughs> para que ellos puedan también uh, tener ellos también su visa. So, my name is Fidelina Moreno and I was victim of aggravated assault and I, I want to thank you on behalf of my children and my husband because also uh, my certification was signed. But I do want to request this uh, to continue uh, because all the people that have, that are in fear and that have uh, gone through traumas also should be able to um, be able to apply or uh, work with Visa U. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Erica Rojas. La siguiente persona, Erica Rojas. Uh, buenas noches, mi nombre es Erika. Uh, yo vivo aquí en Durán y en el 2008 fui víctima de crimen y uh, soy una nueva integrante de la visa U y estoy aquí uh, para pedirles de favor que quiten las restricciones para que pueda tener yo la oportunidad de tener una visa U y estar legal en este país que solo venimos aquí a trabajar para poder ayudar a nuestras familias. Desde ese entonces que fui víctima, siempre he tenido depresión y, y mucho miedo de la comunidad donde vivimos porque hay muchos robos, siguen habiendo muchas víctimas como yo, a las cuales no tienen la ayuda de, o quizás, también de que no saben que, que hay organizaciones que los pueden ayudar como a mí, que yo no sabía y no pedí ayuda ni, ni, ni de psicólogos. Y apenas fue que yo supe del grupo y me uní con ellos para seguir luchando y tener la oportunidad que les han dado a ellos. Eso es todo, gracias. So my name is Erika from Durham. In 2008, I, I was a victim of crime, and I'm applying for Visa U, and I want to ask to please take away the restrictions so I can get the Visa U and uh, legally be able to work. Um, we are working families, and since this happened, I've been suffering from depression and fear uh, because of robberies. And there are more victims like me that may not know about organizations or how to reach for psychological help. Uh, so that's why I wanted to come here 
and continue to fight to ask for this visa to be, the restrictions to be taken away. Thank you. Gracias. Buenas noches. Gracias. Could you tell her that the chief has uh, said that uh, in the next six months she is planning to lift the time restrictions? Uh, queremos dejarte saber que la jefe de policía nos ha dejado saber que el plan de eh, ellos es que en seis meses sean levantadas las restricciones. Thank you very much. Our next speaker. Muchas gracias. In which month will this be? She was in March. Thank you. In, after which one will she be able to apply? It'll, it'll be announced. Well, it, it'll be, it, it will be announced in the public. She will, 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 it will be publicly announced. Esta información va a ser anunciada de manera pública. Uh, our next speaker is Ivan Almonte Pimentel. En la siguiente persona que va a hablar va a ser Ivan Almonte. Welcome, Pimentel. Ivan. Please give us your name and address. Gracias. Danos tu nombre y tu dirección. Yo puedo hablar inglés. Hi, good evening. My name is Ivan Almonte. I live on 311 South LaSalle Street. So I've been living in Durham for 20 years. And I'm so proud of these women that were victims of a crime. I has been seven times in Durham as well. So I really encourage all the city council members that we do really need to have uh, honest conversations with our communities. We have been outreaching the community at the flea market, talking with a lot of Latinos here in Durham. Many of them, they, they might be eligible to apply for the U visa, but because of the time restriction, they cannot apply. So now we have the most progressive city council in Durham, so we need to some action. We keep talking about the GOP, about all these policies at the federal level, but we in Durham, we have this type of policies that limit us to be eligible for the U visa. So I know a lot of people, they might, they might not know what is a U visa is, but immigrants without a status, they can apply if they were victims of a crime. So let's pay atten attention because we live in the neighborhoods where all these crimes are happening. And, but oftentimes, we see all these people with a lot of privilege. They don't live in the na these neighborhoods, but they don't want to provide the resources that our community needs. So please, we need to listen to the victims. We need to listen to our communities who are affected. Every single weekend, we, we hear about people. I was a victim 20 years ago. I was a victim like 12 years ago. And then I'm being a victim again, so we need to have those conversations. So we need to go to our communities and listen to them. We're gonna, because we pay taxes, so they need to hear to us too. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Dennis Garrett. Mr. Garrett, welcome. Please give us your name and address, and you have three minutes. Love and respect. My name is Dennis. I really ain't here to talk to the city council. I'm here to talk to the, to the public. Like, I'm going to run for city council because I'm tired of every time we have these meetings, all we do is we come here. They already don't have a meeting three, four times. They don't have a meeting already. They already knew what they was going to talk about before they got here. They give us three minutes to talk about somebody that just been killed. Chief, I want to say thank you because you are doing a great, a lot of things in the community. I thank you, the mayor. I thank you for all y'all doing and all you're going to do, but it ain't enough. It ain't enough. So we need to put people in the office that understand what's going on in the street. I'm from the street, and I got a past. So they're going to come up with all the dirt about my past. I'm telling you, I'm from the street, so I got a past. But I'm going to run for city council. I'm asking you, vote for me so people like me can be back there when they make them decisions. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. Wow. All right. Um, that concludes the speakers. Council Member Freeman. And then any other council members with any comments or questions, and then we'll move on to the next item. I have a question for Chief Davis. Chief, uh, there's a question for you. Almost made it to the door. Almost. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So just very specifically, the the reason that the ladies speaking today asking about the U visa um, <coughs> resonates for me is that I think all crimes should be reported, every single last one. 
and how you report after reporting it is it's more than just the report it's actually having investigations that actually follow up to find out what happened and to track and res like to create the safety that's needed how would you do that if you were limited this year from having those 25 additional officers that you asked for initially? Well, um, we will work with the resources that we have at hand, especially to follow up on crimes, investigators to be able to go out and uh, follow up with our victims on various types of crimes. Um, it absolutely gives us more flexibility to um, prepare uh, officers to go to the next level and to add um, support to the department. Um, made a comment about even the explosion a couple of weeks ago. That was my observation. My observation at the explosion was that I had um, officers and investigators who were not in uniform, who should have been in uniform at a scene that catastrophic, trying to manage traffic control if it were a different kind of incident in my head, I was thinking that, I don't know if this is a person who is really someone who is there to manage traffic control or is this somebody who um, I shouldn't pay any attention to because I rolled up on that particular individual. But it makes me think about the resources, not just about patrolling, but about a city that is experiencing unusual occurrences and mitigating those types of occurrences too. So I'm, I look at our staffing from a holistic standpoint, not just having officers on the street, but how, does, how, how do we matriculate to another level and have better officers, have the type of training for our officers? I know this isn't a budget meter or anything, but just to respond to that, making sure that they have time to train and be able to respond to citizens appropriately as well. So um, I would hope that we wouldn't waver as it relates to responding to victims, um, especially victims that expect the police department to come and you know help them find justice in, that, in their particular situation. So thank you. I also would like to ask, um, so you mentioned the explosion. I'm just wondering how efficient it is to actually have officers working overtime rather than having the additional officers. It's not good for officer wellness at all. Um, uh, we work unusual occurrences like that. If we have an unusual occurrence, we're going to work it as long as we have to. But that shouldn't be the daily operation. And that's just, from my standpoint, the type of work that they do every day. Um, requires um, an appropriate amount of downtime uh, from their day-to-day -day, uh, activities as opposed to taking advantage of supplemental and sometimes just like kids, you gotta tell them to stop. They'll keep you know, filling in the gaps until um, sometimes they break. And unfortunately, an officer breaking is different from someone working for corporate America breaking. So, um, We'll continue to evaluate, you know, our officers, and now we're managing their overtime and supplemental as well, so that they aren't working as many hours as they have, you know, before. Um, while I'm standing here too, I want to um, also respond to uh, Councilmember Austin. I had those numbers in my notes; I just couldn't see them. Um, the decrease was um, by 12 percent, 69, compared to 61 multi-victim firearm incidents. Yeah. Thank you very Council much. Member uh, Freeman, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. All right. Chief, thank you very much. We thank appreciate you. you. Thank Thanks you. for the report, and we're lucky to have you. Thank you, sir. Grateful for what you do. Thank you. All right, uh, we're going to move on now to item 26 under public hearings. <clears throat> this is the Patterson Place Compact Suburban Design District Text Amendment and Zoning Map Change. And uh, we'll uh, now hear the report from staff. Good evening. I'm Lisa Miller with the Planning Department. Uh, I'd like to start off by stating for the record that all Planning Department hearing items have been advertised and noticed in accordance with state and local law, and affidavits uh, of all notices are on file in the Planning Department. 
Um, so I have a brief introduction to begin your consideration of the Patterson Place Compact Suburban Design District project tonight. This project includes the creation of new zoning regulations to be applied to compact neighborhood tiers with existing auto-oriented context through a UDO text amendment. It then applies those regulations to the Patterson Place compact neighborhood tier through the zoning map change, um, establishing the placement of three subdistricts, core support one and support two. And finally, it includes a proposed future street network to be fully designed and precisely placed as property is developed or redeveloped. This is in order to ensure smaller block sizes and to implement multimodal street design standards in the creation of new streets. This particular project is supported by a myriad of comprehensive plan policies and is the culmination of work by staff and a variety of stakeholders that began in October of 2016 after the compact neighborhood tier boundaries were reassessed and revised. It's also useful to note that many long-standing homeowners in the area have been expecting and waiting for this change long before our work with this project began. Um, so I'd like mostly to talk about why, in light of the discontinuation of the Durham Orange Light Rail project, staff believes that this project should continue moving forward. As I mentioned at your work session in March when this question was raised, uh, albeit in a slightly different context uh, in terms of the project, staff has had the opportunity to think about this scenario at least a handful of times in the last two and a half years while the project has been underway and the light rail project experienced one obstacle or another. We continue reaching the same conclusion, which is that whether the transit system precedes or follows, we need to create significant pockets of dense, walkable, mixed-use development in parts of our community to accommodate the growth we're experiencing. And Patterson Place is somewhat uniquely served in comparison to our other adopted compact neighborhood tiers by existing high-capacity roadways and well-used regional and local transit service. In addition, its location between Durham and Chapel Hill make it the best candidate of our existing tiers to implement this project without the Durham Orange Light Rail Transit. There are also short-range plans to increase frequency of existing transit service, both locally for 15-minute headways on the Route 10, um, both to serve Patterson Place and New Hope Commons on either side of 15501, and regionally at the, with the rerouting of Go Triangle's 405 route to the Patterson Place Shopping Center. We believe that the development that can be created under the design district framework is better than what the current zoning designations allow. We want to encourage the kind of development that can help us grow more sustainably in areas that have existing infrastructure and access and take advantage of places where that infrastructure and access is intended to be improved whether through additional lanes on I-40, modifications to the 15501 corridor, or a Giffen's lift station upgrade. When property redevelops, and we believe it will, even without the light rail, we want to ensure that it does so in a way to create walkable places. Further, the proposed regulations provide an opportunity to test the affordable housing bonus structure that significantly incentivizes the provision of affordable units. And along with that, we continue to commit to monitoring and reassessing that particular regulation and the number of units, both affordable and market, that are created, as well as the rest of the design district regulations, which we have uh, consistently monitored and modified as needed since their initial implementation in 2010 uh, with the downtown design district. We also continue to believe there's great opportunity in the creation of connections across I-40 to create local circulation from Gateway to East Town through New Hope Commons and to Patterson Place. It's also worth noting um, that some of the Durham's elected officials on the Go Triangle Board have stated a desire to continue to preserve the Durham Orange Light Rail corridor for potential repurposing for other high frequency transit types. As work on a new transit plan and a new comprehensive plan for Durham begin, we'll have the opportunity to ensure that this area continues to be a priority for high frequency, high capacity transit to serve the land use vision carried out in this project. I would be happy to answer questions on the project or go into greater detail on aspects of the proposal. Um, I wanted to mention, as noted in your memo, that the planning commission meeting results had not been uh, finalized by the time the memo went out. The planning commission did vote on the three different pieces of the project um, they voted to recommend against the project five to six on the text amendment, five to six on the zoning map change, and four to seven on the street network. 
Um, and I just wanted to call your attention to the fact that we have five motions that will be necessary at the time that you're ready to take action on the item. The consistency statement for the text amendment, the text amendment itself, the consistency statement for the zoning map change, the zoning map change itself, and the resolution on the street network. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Miller. We appreciate it. Uh, you have heard the report from staff, and I'm now going to declare this public hearing open, and I'm going to ask first if there are any members of the council who have questions or comments for Ms. Miller at this point. Just, yeah. just one question regarding the way that the compact district is designed is based on the light rail, and I know that it accounted for that rail line. In the same way, do you think that it would account for, well, I think if you pause to say, to look at what is happening now in the neighborhoods, specifically around, there's so much green space in that area, and what we're talking about is adding a whole lot more concrete, and I'm concerned that what water runoff will look like and how storm water will be handled, and I'm not sure that the current I mean, the current district plan in, accounts for that, and I just want to verify if it does or not. We did, part of the reason that we created the compact suburban design designation as opposed to using one of the existing design district designations, which are compact and downtown, um, was because we felt like, as opposed to the areas where we'd previously put the regulations in place, we had an existing context where it wasn't as uh, constrained of a tight in urban environment that allowed us to do more with um, you know, creating a green stormwater infrastructure opportunity in the streetscape, uh, requiring a greater amount of open space, uh, allowing um, opportunities for green roofs and, and things like that to be part of uh, parking structures that are created. Things that we thought we, we had opportunity to really to, to do more on those things that are harder to do in a more constrained urban environment. I think. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions at this point? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just had a couple of questions about the densities that were developed and whether you all think that those densities could be supported by a light rail alternative like bus rapid transit, um, or are they are they now higher than what we would expect bus rapid transit to support given that we developed them based on we would have, thinking we would have light rail? Sure. Um, so the buy rate density is partly because of the use of the affordable housing bonus um, are a slight increase over what you know, our approach with the affordable housing bonus. Let me step back a second. Um, is to slightly increase the densities kind of overall throughout the district as opposed to a significant increase like we did with downtown or Ninth Street and then only allow that really big bump when you are providing the 15% affordable units. Um, so the densities that we're talking about are um, between 9 and 30 units per acre that are by right. Um, I believe that that is supportable with bus rapid transit. Um, and then any units that we get above that density are going to, is going to be because we've created affordable housing units. And I, so I think the opportunity there um, and the, the, the ability to serve with bus rapid transit, I think is, is completely doable. Great, thank you. Do you think that given that there will not be a light rail station there, that there will be desire or the market for those sort of larger buildings that we were hopeful could include the affordable housing component? I think that's a great question. Um, we have continued to see um, and kind of increasing as we've been working on this project interest in land development in that area. And um, I don't believe that that was light rail dependent because construction of the light rail obviously hasn't even, hadn't even begun and was projected 10 years out. Um, there is interest in development there currently, and I think part of the reason that we feel it's important to move this forward now is because we want to make sure that as the area develops, that it doesn't develop in the existing pattern and kind of lose our opportunity to get 
a lot of the growth that's happening here in jobs and housing to, to happen in a, in a more condensed, walkable, mixed-use fashion. Okay. There were a couple of comments in the memo about all of the naturally occurring affordable housing that's in this area and figuring out a strategy to protect and preserve some of that as development continues. Could you give us an update on what work has happened towards that and kind of where we are on that? Sure. Um, so we are continuing to work with our partners in community development to uh, look at opportunities for maintaining that um, naturally occurring affordable housing. Most of it is within the 60 to 80 percent uh, area median income range. Um, one of the things that I do think um, was the case previously and probably more so now with the light rail project not on the books is that we don't believe that there's going to be immediate pressure on those uh, units. And so um, having time to continue to work with community development um, and the developments there to figure out how to fund retaining that affordability is, is something we have time to do. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. How's it going tonight? Um, we had a specific, maybe this is a little bit in the weeds, but a specific issue raised by um, someone who came to talk to us about congregate living facilities um, and the fact that they are considered residential for the purposes of the height limits uh, with respect to uh, projects with and without an affordable housing component. Uh, can you talk a little bit about if or why that makes sense in this context, given that those congregate living facilities include a number of services and the other types of sort of sub-facilities within them, like healthcare, um, cafeterias, those types of things, uh, how or what, if that makes sense to be categorized in that residential portion? Sure, um, this is something that we've had a chance to just briefly look at as it was raised relatively recently, um, but certainly uh, it seems like there may be a good argument for using the non-residential height limitations for the group living categories within the use table. Um, for the purposes of this evening, we didn't have enough time to fully uh, vet that and make sure that there were no unintended consequences of that. Um, and so it's something that we've uh, let that individual know that we could entertain in the omnibus text amendment to address that modification. Okay, so we think that might be, you'll, you'll do some work on that and maybe come back to us about it later. Yeah. Fantastic, I appreciate that. Um, my last question is more of a, I'm gonna save that till after the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem. Pro Tem. Oh, I'm sorry. You're the boss. I'm the boss. <laughs> All right, um, so we have several people signed up to speak on this item. Our first speaker is Michael Waldrop. Thank you, Mr. Waldrop. You have three minutes, and please um, give us your name and address. Happily. Um, my name is Michael Waldrop, 5324 McFarland, in the heart of Patterson Place. First of all, I'd like to thank the council members and Mr. Mayor that I was able to meet with today. Um, we had good discussion, and, and Charlie, thank you for raising that question. Um, I... I've done a lot of thinking about this. I've had plenty of time. I've had decades of time to think about Patterson Place. Um, I support the project. There are many things that, that are really very good that are coming out of this. The street designs, um, you know, there's just a number of things. I have some concern, excuse me, the street sections, not necessarily the street plan, the street network plan. I'm very concerned about the street network plan and the, its interface with the 15501 corridor designs that were just made available you know, a few days ago. And then, of course, there's the open question of, of what we do, if anything, to put uh, a substitute, a replacement for light rail in the corridor. So I'm certainly not going to, <laughs> I couldn't do it if I wanted to, but I, I certainly don't want the perfect to, to be the enemy of the good. I support the project. I know there's, got, uh, there's been a lot of work that's gone into this. I handed over our own private efforts to come up with a compact neighborhood when, when that was still an option as a privately initiated venture in October of, of 2014. So four and a half years ago um, was when we basically saw the start of this process. And uh, it's good to see something come out of it at this point. And, and, and 
allow us to move forward. But again, I think there's a, a number of issues that I hope you will individually or collectively take interest in, and they all relate to the big handmaiden of land use planning, which is transportation planning. And uh, we've got a lot of work ahead of ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Waldrop. <clears throat> Our next speaker is uh, Robert Healy. Mr. Healy? And, uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, I don't believe we did the thing where we allocate time to a sign. I'm sorry, we sure didn't. I'm sorry, I missed that up. <coughs> My bad. Okay. Uh, Bob, hang on one sec, okay? Thank you. I've been, I've been uh, repurposed. Okay, uh, Mr. Hall here. Yes, Mr. Hall, would you characterize yourself as a proponent or an opponent? Would you characterize yourself as a proponent or an opponent of this? You're undecided. All right. Okay, I got it. I got it. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, and we're going to say, let's see, we've got one, two, three, four people who have signed up as proponents. We have one, two people who have signed up as opponents. And um, we have one person, Mr. Hall. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to give three minutes to each of the speakers. We'll see if the opponents who don't have as many speakers need a little more time. Okay? Mr. Healy? Welcome. Thank you very you much. I, I'm Bob. <laughs> are you ready? Yes, we are. Okay, I'm Bob Healy. I live at 839 Sedgefield. I've been a Durham resident for 32 years. And for uh, the last uh, 27 years, uh, I have been the uh, chair or co-chair of the New Hope Creek Advisory Committee, which has advised local governments on the implementation of the adopted 1992 New Hope Plan. Uh, this has resulted in protection uh, investment of over $5 million in federal, state, and local, and private funds to protect the integrity of the New Hope Corridor for both natural values and public recreation. One of the things has been the council in 2005 uh, voted to, along with all the other jurisdictions, to raise the bridge at the replacement bridge at 15501 over New Hope Creek at a cost of a million dollars to permit wildlife and persons movement underneath that bridge. And we're concerned today with a large tract of land that's immediately adjacent to this on the north side of 15501. When staff initially uh, came up with their proposal, they suggested a 300-foot setback of development from the New Hope floodplain. They had conversations with the developer, to which we were not a party, and they changed their recommendations to a 200-foot uh, transitional use permit zone uh, for the same property. We can't support this. It doesn't cover enough <coughs> of the property to really see that New Hope values are given adequate scrutiny. Now, this is not my opinion. We have had six ecologists look at this land. Three of them have PhDs. All of them have long, long experience, including Steve Hall, who probably has the longest. Uh, three of them have 30 years experience in studying the New Hope in that very area. There are 12 uh, cameras motion activated underneath that bridge to track wildlife. We don't believe that this is this 200-foot uh, transitional zone is sufficient. <clears throat> we think there is an alternative. We know there's been major changes in the LRT. We don't know what's going to happen to 15501. We don't know what's going to happen as a replacement to the LRT. What we suggest is this property be simply taken out of the compact neighborhood until we understand how all of this fits together. We think this go slower approach, no longer motivated by the kinds of strict deadlines that the federal process involved, is much better than a blanket upzoning, 
with no real protection for the corridor, what I think is no real guarantee of low and moderate income housing. Uh, and we think we should wait to integrate this into the new comprehensive plan and the new plan for a different kind of transit system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Healy. Uh, I'm now going to call uh, the rest of the proponents. Um, Mr. Patrick Biker, followed by Reynolds Smith and Jim Sparra. And if Mr. Smith and Mr. Sparra, you could come over here to the right of the uh, podium, that would be great. Mr. Biker, welcome. You have three minutes. Good evening, Mayor Shul, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, members of the City Council. I'm Patrick Biker. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I've lived in Southwest Durham for 25 years, and I also served as chairman of the Durham Area Transit Authority from the late 90s to the early 2000s. I attended all of the neighborhood outreach meetings hosted by the Planning Department for tonight's agenda item as a concerned citizen and as a transit advocate. Now, even though I've represented several property owners on the district you're considering tonight, I attended all of those meetings as a resident of Southwest Durham, and I was very impressed with the work that our staff did to bring, to this, to bring you this item tonight. So I'm here this evening to encourage you all to vote to approve the staff recommendation. The Planning Department has labored for years with this task, and now is the time to move forward. I'm pretty sure everyone in this room had the best intentions in regard to the Durham area, I'm sorry, Durham Orange light rail transit project, but it did not work out. And that's just the way life is sometimes. Nevertheless, the fact remains that the Planning Department did a very good job with community outreach and striking the right balance among a wide range of community interests. That's probably why this agenda item came to you tonight with I think it was 27 attachments. I will not tell you that I read all of them, but I can see that the Planning Department did a thorough, professional, and thoughtful presentation of the key issues. In that regard, I want to acknowledge the hard work and expertise of Lisa Miller and Scott Whiteman in particular, in addition to Planning Director Pat Young and Assistant Director Sarah Young. For all these reasons, it is time to move forward with approval of the staff recommendation for Patterson Place, and I hope you'll do that. Thank you for your time tonight, and Mayor, if it's appropriate, I'd like to reserve the remaining minute and 20 seconds for rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Biker. Um, Mr. Reynolds Smith. Mr. Smith, welcome. You have three minutes. Good evening. I'm Reynolds Smith. I live at 1905 Old Red Mountain Road in Rougemont. I'm on the Durham Open Space and Trails Advisory Commission. I'm chair of its Open Space Committee, and I'm here to represent their interests. What concerns us in this development is its location along the western edge of the New Hope Creek Wildlife Corridor. Like every other citizen group that's offered opinions, the Sierra Club, the Audubon Society, the New Hope Creek Advisory Committee, and others, open space and trails can accept these proposed zoning changes, and we enthusiastically welcome the steep slope protections. But also, like these other groups, we prefer a 300-foot transitional use area as the planning department originally proposed last summer rather than the 200 feet it now suggests. 300 feet, roughly 100 meters, is what the best ecological and biological science recommends. You can see our reference to this fact in the Environmental Law Institute citation provided in DOST's memo to you of last December. At least 300 feet is necessary to insulate and protect wildlife, especially during floods, and to mitigate the degradation of water quality in Jordan Lake, a reservoir already threatened by excessive nutrient levels. But whether or not these zoning recommendations are approved, whether or not the proposals for a design district at pa Patterson Place are accepted or even totally abandoned, the New Hope Creek Corridor now confronts a real and immediate threat from development. This land is a state-designated natural heritage area. It links many special habitats containing rare and threatened species. It was created in the 1990s by four cooperating jurisdictions in one of the very first multi-jurisdictional open space agreements in this state. You've heard about the efforts on the bridge from Bob Healy. This important change was done at great cost, but it was necessary to preserve the the corridor's greatest ecological benefit, which is the connection it provides between numerous special habitats. 
Without a functioning connection between them, these habitats will shrink and disappear along with the species that live in them. Now the corridor is being challenged at exactly this point, its most vulnerable point, its narrowest point, the point where the bridge passes over it on the Durham Chapel Hill Boulevard. In July of last year, a developer submitted a grading plan that would allow mass grading and tree removal at exactly this most vulnerable point. That plan conformed to existing legislation put in place by the state legislature in the wake of the 2010 elections, and so the grading plan had to be administratively approved. But this plan now gives these developers the vested right to destroy the very features that the planning department is here proposing new regulations to protect. It's a dangerous time in the fight for the environment today. In the 1970s, at the dawn of the environmental movement, it was widely understood that environmental issues were first of all local issues. It was in the specific localities where environmental problems existed. Go ahead. Oh. Go ahead, Reynolds. You got a little bit more time. Okay. We have to defend what this special place exists for. In, if, no, if North Carolina state government is now a chief obstacle to this defense, this cannot be allowed to be a secret. If our rights to defense have been abrogated, well, this must be public knowledge. It should not just slide on by without notice, without comment, without objection. People will want to know that before the bulldozers and skid steers descend into New Hope Canyon, our leaders first said, no way. No way. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Svara. Mr. Svara, please give us your name and address. Welcome. You have three minutes. Uh, good evening. Jim Svara, 1114 Woodburn Road. I'm speaking on behalf of the Coordinating Committee for the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit. We still feel it is still appropriate to approve these standards that will encourage dense, mixed-use, mixed-income, walkable suburban development. Patterson Place is well connected by transit to the rest of Durham. Not only can residents of Durham get there, but the residents of Patterson Place would be able to get downtown into other parts of Durham. Uh, the, we think this is a model with regard to the affordable housing provisions because it includes limits on density uh, as at right feature, uh, but then provides important incentives um, in order to encourage affordable units 15% or more uh, for persons at 60% or below area median income. Uh, these are a density bonus uh, that, that overcomes that limit on density. In fact, there are no density maximums uh, in, the, in the three areas. Uh, the design requirements are more flexible with the possibility for greater <coughs> height. Uh, the current uh, normal height restrictions are 145 feet to 35 feet across the subdistricts. Uh, with the affordable housing, the height requirements will be 300 feet in the core, 145 feet in uh, subdistrict two, subdistrict one, and 60 feet in subdistrict two. There's also greater flexibility uh, on, uh, on on parking. Um, there are two revisions that I would, would that we would like to propose uh, in this framework. Uh, first of all, the height limits. Uh, the height limit of 300 feet for commercial use in the core area and 145 feet for residential use gives a strong incentive. Uh, for commercial over residential development. Uh, that limit for housing can be increased to 300 feet uh, for residential use or a component that includes some residential use. That's appropriate, but, but we don't think that that 300-foot uh, commercial uh, limit uh, is appropriate. It provides too strong an incentive uh, for, for commercial over residential. Uh, and that same philosophy should be applied in the other two areas as well. I have a handout. And that is the, the boundaries of the core area. Um, we propose that it be, that be reduced in size. Uh, in part, we don't need as much space for transit station with the bus uh, alternatives that will be considered over light rail. Um, but also, this will mean that the incentives uh, in sub-district, in sub-area one, uh, will be more powerful uh, than if that extended area um, to, on your map, the area that's to the right of the line uh, that's been drawn in, uh, if that's shifted over to, uh, to sub-district sub one, the incentives will be stronger. 
Uh, so I encourage you to improve the proposal with these revisions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Safara. Um, we now have two uh, more speakers who have signed up to speak in opposition, one in opposition, and then Mr. Hall. Uh, Mr. John Kent, welcome. Uh, please give us your name and address, and you have three minutes. Did you ride over on your bicycle? I did. Uh, my name is John Kent. I live at 394 Cub Creek Road in Chapel Hill, um, and I have been a uh, technical advisor to the New Hope Creek Corridor Advisory Committee since the early 90s. Uh, and from a similar time, I've headed a volunteer group that has done uh, water quality monitoring on New Hope Creek from Stagecoach Road. We, we do six sites monthly, uh, and we've kept it up. We're in our 29th year. Stagecoach Road up into Orange County. Uh, north of Calvander. Um, and I am a regular attendee of the Open Space Subcommittee of DOST. And um, I know some of you because I also go to the Bike Ped uh, Committee here. And it's basically because I am an advisor mother henning the New Hope Creek. Um, I want to uh, stress this is a very special place um, that is uh, on, it's, it's crossed by the main drag between downtown Durham and downtown Chapel Hill. Furthermore, it's the main drag which has an interstate interchange on it. And with or without the LRT, this is prime real estate. Every developer looks at the four quadrants when you have two big highways and an interchange. And I don't think you should be giving away density. And I, without the LRT, you don't have to worry about um, making the system viable. It's unfortunate that the LRT isn't going to happen, but it's not going to. And so um, I, I know staff has put a lot of time into this. I've been to all of the meetings. Um, I was instrumental, and I go back on being involved. We are involved in getting the bridge done. I did that in 2000. Um, I was involved in getting the line put next to 15501 so it didn't cut a new swath through the woods east to Kroger's or what was Kroger's. Um, I, if you're going to pass it, I think you should take the part out north of 15501 east of Mount Moriah Road. Um, I also think if you are going to pass it um, and, and that's left in, we need a 300-foot setback. Not a TUA, we need a setback from the edge of the compact neighborhood boundary. And that's a, that's a compromise already on that. Um, we're going downslope into the flood zone from the original uh, May 2018 Planning Department proposal to do it from the edge of the 100-year floodplain. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Kent. Mr. Hall. Welcome, Mr. Hall. Please give us your name and address, and you have three minutes. Okay, I'm Stephen Hall. I live in um, Chapel Hill. And in the 19, late 1980s, like uh, early 1990s, um, I participated in three uh, in inventories of the natural areas and wildlife habitats of this region, from Orange County, Durham County, all the way down to Chat Chatham. And the one link between all three of those counties in terms of the natural areas and the species that live in this area was the, the, the New Hope Creek floodplain, the waters of New Hope Creek itself, and also the adjoining slopes. So I'm speaking in support of uh, as much conservation of these natural areas along New Oak Creek as, as, we can, uh, as we can manage. During those inventories, I had the great good fortune to work with both Margaret Nygaard and Hildegard Riles, two of the most important conservation figures in the history of North Carolina. And they had the foresight to see that this, this area needs to be conserved and is special to all the people who live in these, these not just the three counties, but the uh, the entire Piedmont of the state. So if we can remember their vision, um, 
and protect as much of the slopes, floodplains, and waters of, the, of New Hope Creek as possible. Um, that's what I wish to um, support and hope that we all remember their, uh, their vision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Is there anyone else who would like to be heard on this item? This is a public hearing. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard at this item at this time? I'm going to uh, uh, keep the public hearing open, and I'm going to now uh, ask if there are other questions or comments by members of the council. Ms. Miller, I have some questions. Um, So uh, let's see where to start here exactly. This was a prodigious piece of work. Um, and I want to thank you and um, all the members of the planning staff that worked on this, uh, all the <coughs> outreach that you've done, all the uh, good thinking that's gone into this. Um, and I think one of the speakers already mentioned, I think, even for us, just reading this item was an enormous amount of reading, and I know that uh, you all have just put your heart and soul into this. Um, we are in a different environment without the light rail, and you gave your reasons why you thought, nevertheless, we ought to move forward with this, and I thought, I agree that those reasons in terms of transportation are persuasive. Uh, I think that um, there's still plenty of transportation to get out here. Um, and I think that uh, in the not too distant future, that will be strengthened. Exactly how we will be getting through this quarter, we don't know. But we don't, we, what we know hasn't changed is that this is a super important quarter for us to get through. The fact that 15501 is clogged with traffic and will be more clogged with traffic things are only going to get worse. And so we're going to have to have a transit solution. Patterson Place will have to be part of that transit solution. And so I found what you had to say about that uh, persuasive. Um, I want to mention in particular the TOD guidebook, which I thought is excellent. And I was glad that you all made use of that TOD guidebook as you worked. Um, I think, again, that's you know, it's it's one of the one of the one of the um, one of the it was some of the fallout from not having the light rail is that we have all this tremendous work like the TOD guidebook, which is now only kind of partially relevant, uh, but still extremely relevant here in Patterson Place, and um, appreciated the way in which you all uh, made use of that. There is some question about, uh, they've been raised kind of by the speakers today and other, some of the planning commission comments and so forth, questions about the extent to which this is too much upzoning at this point or not enough upzoning at this point. So you've made a decision to uh, upzone uh, some, uh, but, not, uh, but, but not the extent to which you think developers will want there so you believe they will then come in and ask for the affordable housing bonus to get additional density. Was that a fair statement? That was the goal, yeah. yep. Do you think that, um, ha how has the light rail changed that equation? Has that changed that equation? And the Mayor Pro Tem asked earlier similarly about that, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that was always noteworthy about the Patterson Place area, you know, again, uh, leaning on the expert uh, work that we had with the consultant team on the TOD planning grant and their national and I think international work in, in TOD planning, um, is knowledge that places that have a suburban context in place are very difficult to transition into a non-suburban uh, development pattern. Um, I, I think that the, the, the development intensities that we've set with this, as we took into account um, this uh, way of implementing an affordable housing bonus, 
actually sets us up very well to continue that path forward without the light rail. I think there was a little bit, um, you, this was outlined, uh, I think, by Mr. Waldrop's emails, but then also in the Go Triangle memo that maybe uh, we were not setting up quite enough intensity for the light rail. Um, so I think there's a little bit less concern of that without the light rail being in place, but we still have densities that are um, increased from what's there existing um, that are at a level that we can create the mixed use walkable places and, and the design standards and, and, and form standards to allow that to occur um, that I think can easily be supported by other means of transit. So I believe that we're still finding a balance that will function here. So our, our affordable housing bonuses elsewhere have unfortunately been unsuccessful even though they're very aggressive. We, I think that uh, we could have reasonably predicted that um, light rail could have created the kind of the need, the demand for density that would have um, elicited proposals for the density bonus. Do you think, absent that, that the the the, the in the short term, do you think that? that it's likely that people will seek that density bonus? I, I know you don't know the answer to that question, but I wonder what your best judgment is. Um, I think it's hard to, it kind of depends on what short term means to you. Um, I think there will be interest in the level of intensity that would require the bonus in a somewhat short range uh, future. Mm -hmm. What that exactly is, I think obviously depends on a whole lot of factors, mm -hmm. um, but I believe that that, that range of densities that would require the bonus are set in such a way that it, it would be uh, would be desirable to utilize in the in the short range future. You also commented in response to the merit pro tem's questions about the naturally occurring affordable housing, but I didn't, could you repeat what you said about that? What do you what do you think the future of that housing is? Sure. So one of the things that I mentioned in re in response to that question uh, is that. Uh, and, and it kind of relates back to the, the difficulty in changing the shape of, of a place that is uh, suburban uh, development, that I think it's gonna take some time before we see significant development pressures. Not to say that there won't be development interest because as I mentioned previously, we've, we've still seen development interest here, um, but that those developments, um, they're, you know, they're not kind of at the end of their lifespan as far as we can tell based on how long other developments are in place that are of that kind of residential. Um, and so I think that we do have some time to continue to work out how we can preserve that affordability as the pressures of, of new development come into that area. And when you talked about working with the community development department on that, are you thinking then that that will involve some sort of eventually, I mean, are you thinking so that this, these will be subsidized in some way in the future? Will they be, well, is that your, is that your thinking? Because, you know, all of our subsidy efforts are very much geared towards downtown in, in the short term. Sure. So what, what are you, what, what, what is the, as you were, Give me a little bit more about what your thoughts are. Yeah, and I think uh, the, again, more great work that is somewhat, use, some of it is useful and some of it may not be, but the, the Triangle J Council of Governments report that's included yeah. as an attachment is something that's been a great resource for us. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think one of the things discussed about the potential for trying to retain that affordability would be to actually find a way to buy that affordability. So yes, I understand that the sort of five-year goals are oriented very much on downtown, and, and that's part of why this is a continuing conversation to look at what other alternatives there may be. Yeah, and I agree. It's quite possible um, that, uh, you know, I, I can see that the timeline might work, but it's hard to tell. Uh, but I hope that, yeah, so, but I appreciate your efforts along that line. But I I do think it's going to be really important over the next few years to really think about the naturally occurring affordable housing out there uh, with community development, with our, uh, uh, you know, housing advocates and others 
uh, because we don't have an obvious subsidy at this point. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that we couldn't have one, um, but it is something that we need to really think about. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it is imaginable to me that we might have a private developer with a 4% tax credit or something uh, that might be part of that, in which case we might have no subsidy or a minimal one. Uh, it, but in that case, we may not be getting the density we want either, that likely to be you know, garden apartments or something. So I do think it's, a, it's tricky, uh, but it's also incredibly hard to predict these things, and I appreciate your doing your best to do so. On page three of the memo, of the memo it says about something about allowing creative configurations of dense single and two-family residential with integrated open spaces. How, wh what did that mean? So essentially that was um, creating a provision that just applies in the support to subdistrict, that as long as you're falling within the minimum and maximum densities that are set for that district, um, that there can be uh, single family and, and duplex uh, housing developments that's basically like a, a really flexible PDR. So you can uh -huh. kind of create, uh, you know, a little bit more unique setting without having to go through the process of creating a PDR. Got it. Thank you. That's really helpful. And that's great. Glad to hear that. Um, the... You've heard tonight and uh, we've heard about um, the request by various groups to expand the trans transitional use area to 300 feet from 200 feet. Um, as I understand it, your decision to recommend the 200 feet has largely to do with an existing developer who's threatening to mass grade by right on a large parcel of land partially in the TUA and has indicated he will do so if the 200 foot 2UA is raised to 300 feet. Did I get that right? Mostly. Um, we actually, so we initially put out the idea of a 300 foot setback from the floodplain. Um, and as we further looked at uh, what we could legally do within the bounds of North Carolina laws on environmental regulations, as well as looked at um, some of the research that was provided to us both by the environmental stakeholders um, and the, um, an environmental engineer hired by property owners. Um, we saw a wide range of recommendations for a variety of different uh, conservation or um, ecological corridor uses for, um, or creek corridors. And um, revised our recommendation based on all of that. Then, and so we, we created the 200 foot transitional use area um, after going through that uh, consideration. Um, then the, uh, then the part where the, the property owner um, has existing entitlements for the probably largest contiguous area of undeveloped land adjacent to the New Hope Creek Corridor under the existing zoning regulations, um, which has, uh, it does not have the revised steep slope requirements. It does not have a 200 foot transitional use area. Um, there are existing uh, entitlements in terms of the zoning for um, the area that we've heard identified as the most important part of the corridor, which is adjacent to the um, where the corridor goes under 15501. Um, there's a PDR zoning with a development plan that allows uh, three, about 350 um, senior living units in one of the most kind of a finger that goes up into the most sensitive areas. Um, through the process um, and reflected in the, the zoning ordinance, uh, we received a proffer from the, the property owner um, that has, has those entitlements um, that if this moves forward with a 200 foot TUA, that they would agree to remove their mass grading from that 200 foot TUA and subject themselves to the new process of going through a, a major special use permit if they want to develop in that area. Would that include the steep slope 
uh, rules? It does not. It is uh, using the existing steep slope requirements, but would put them into the, the new transitional use area requirements. So they would they would be within they would be with they would it would be the 200 foot transitional use area requirements, not the steep slope requirements, but they would not be able to mass grade. They would anything that they want to do within that 200 foot TUA would not fall under existing entitlement, but would go through that major special use permit. Major process. special use permit. Yes. Okay. Well, help me with the mass grading and how that relates to the major special use permit. Um, so it probably depends on how they would go through that process um, because in their existing plan, um, what they've agreed to do is to pull out of that 200 foot area with that plan. Um, and so I'm not sure if what's left would be considered a mass grading site plan at that point because of the amount of area. Um, but the way that the transitional use area requirements are set up is that there are some specific findings that only relate to kind of the consideration of its impact on the adjacent corridor. Um, that we got some feedback from both the, the Durham County open space staff as well as the um, New Hope Creek folks as we were developing those about what are the, the right considerations for those findings um, and would have to be in keeping with all of those findings to allow encroachment into that 200 foot TUA. So you have to help me with this a little bit more. This is an important question, and we have, um, you can call reinforcements if you want them. Um, Thank you. <laughs> this is a, uh, it, it, the way I, so, so you've heard the, the case for the 300 foot. Transitional use area. Transitional today. use area, thank you. Um, the way I read the memo, The, there is a developer who has by right ability to mass grade significantly into the New Hope corridor, right or not? Depending on how you define the corridor, into, into area that would be protected with the regulations that we've put, uh, drafted. Okay. Yes. And, and they have now proffered that they would submit to the 200 foot TUA and uh, you have to go through a, a major special permit process to do what? Any encroachment of development into that 200 foot TUA has to go through that major special use permit process. And the, the major special- Including mass grading. Including mass grading. And that major special use permit would come to us. Yes. And there would be certain objective criteria that we would uh, be looking at. It would be a quasi-judicial process. Is that right? Correct. And what would be some of the criteria that we would have to look at um, in terms of granting or not granting their major special use permit? The five review factors that are included specifically for this major special use permit are environmental protection, lighting effects on nearby properties, conformance with adopted plans, and other factors. Um, it's on page 26 of the text amendment, um, or I'm happy to read the um, description under each of those items if that's helpful. Now, would you read the headings again, though? Environmental protection, lighting, effects on nearby properties, conformance with adopted plans and other factors. What are the other factors? That's just allowing you all the opportunity to take into consideration other things that are brought to your attention. Okay. So they would come to us for a major special use permit having acceded to the 200 foot TUA. If they don't, if, 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 the, if, if we were to adopt the 300 foot TUA, their stance is what? If you all were to adopt something other than what is, the, than the 200 foot TUA, um, what they have indicated to me is that 
they would remove the proffer related to the to the masquerading site plan that's um, they have entitlements for, um, and also um, that they would not want to be part of the rezoning. Um, they so one of the other pieces that's kind of related um, the split the zoning split parcels um, relates to one of the properties that that they have ownership of. Part of what is included in the zoning uh, ordinance is to take existing uh, protection of 50 some acres that um, goes outside of the compact neighborhood tier and in that PDR um, development plan says that that will, be that will remain undisturbed. So there's a provision in the zoning ordinance before you that includes a basically a translation of that protection into development plan, uh, text only development plan. Um, so my understanding is that they would remove both of those of proffers. So one of the proffers they would remove is that they would be, that, that one of the proffers has to do with the, um, their willingness to submit to the 200 foot TUA and bring us the major special use permit. And could you succinctly describe what the other proffer is that they might that they would withdraw? I will try. Uh, so the existing protection that's part of the PDR development plan basically allows development on a certain portion of the property, which is the sensitive area that I mentioned that's kind of a finger up into the corridor. The remainder of the property that's primarily outside of the compact neighborhood tier is called out as to remain undisturbed in that development plan. This property being rezoned as part of this project would wipe out that development plan. So we've created language working with them to translate that into text only development plan commitment to apply that to that property. Um, the combination of them, so them being unwilling to proffer that if the 200 foot TUA changes, um, would make us uninterested in including them in the rezoning because it would be a significant loss of protection. And I also understand that they would not want to be part of the rezoning if it is changed to a 300 foot TUA. Um, I apologize, that was not more succinct. It's not. Well, it's a, it's a difficult situation. It wasn't more succinct, but I think it deserved not being more succinct. <laughs> um, okay. Still not quite sure I get it, but I, I think I do. The, I have some questions on some other things. Let me just do them. What is a clear zone for sidewalks? Uh, that's an area that needs to remain unobstructed from street furniture, like street lighting, benches, things like that. What is a suspended sidewalk system? Um, you see them most of the time in downtown where there is a, um, the pavers are actually elevated over the street tree pit. So you may not notice, but it's just like you see the tree trunk and a little square space around it, and then there's a system that the pavers sit over the tree pit to allow greater area that you can traverse. Um, makes it so that it's easier to get clear zones and tighter spaces. Okay. Can we prohibit payday lenders from core as well as support one and support two? I believe so. Yeah, that was, so there was a specific uh, item in the Ninth Street plan when it was developed. Um, so that limited use standard was put in place for the compact design district. Um, we had some requests at the planning commission meeting. It was the first time that this issue was raised that we put that same provision in place for the compact suburban design district, um, which is just for support one and support two. So the, the, the request is that we use the Ninth Street model for this or, or? That was the request, but I don't think that was because there was a specific interest in retaining the right to have them in Understood, the understood. Um, is there any reason that we would want to have payday lenders in? 
the Patterson Place area that you're in? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Me, mine either. <laughs> um, How did you decide on the support to boundaries? So uh, about a year and a half ago, um, at the public meeting that we held, we had kind of a workshop style meeting where we asked folks to giving them an understanding of uh, the intention behind the support to subject subdistrict as well as the others. But the support to subdistrict is really intended to be a transition in intensity to what is existing development outside of the compact neighborhood tier. Um, so we asked folks to tell us where are areas that you think are sensitive to transition to. Um, and the area that was identified by the different groups um, was only in the area south of Danziger between Mount Moriah and Southwest Durham Drive down to Old Chapel Hill. Um, one group had it that full extent and in, in another, uh, I think two other groups had it a, a smaller extent. Um, but one of the things that we decided to do as we were implementing the affordable housing bonus strategy that's in place is knowing that the support to has the potential to go up to 145 feet with the use of the bonus. We decided to err on the side of the larger support to area in order to make sure there was a better transition. Thank you. I now have a, a note that I made to myself, Lisa, that I have no idea what it means. Maybe I'll read it to you and you can tell. Okay. Uh, I wrote zoning implementation attachment, page two map, areas one and four, invade open space. <laughs> How will this work? Can you translate that for me, for myself? Can you translate my words to me? Possibly. She's that good. I think it may have been actually. You said page two? Yeah. I think it actually might be what you, we were just discussing. Yes which is the fact that you've got these developers who will be invading this open space. It's actually uh, directly related to the split zoned parcels and retaining existing development plan commitments, just that piece of it. So, so how will that work? Uh, so in the zoning uh, map change ordinance in your packet, um, there's one section that's just about kind of the overall taking these parcels and putting them into the compact suburban design district zoning. Um, there's one provision for each of the two parcels that have the split zone where there's a development plan in place protecting open space that's outside the compact neighborhood tier. And there's a section for each of those translating with a text only development plan to maintain those protections and then an additional item that's related to the proffer from the um, property owner on the north side of 15501. Okay. So on the 300 feet versus the 200 feet, um, we've heard from the folks from New Hope Creek, and these are people that have just devoted a tremendous amount of I don't have to tell you, they've probably been all up in your grill too. Um, <laughs> tremendous amount of time and effort and goodwill and, uh, you know, John rides his bicycle to every, from Chapel Hill to every single BPAC meeting and, um, and their concern, their, their contention is that the best thing for the environment is to have this 300 foot TUA. What I hear you saying is, that the 300 foot TUA is problematic because we have a developer with the right to mass grade into that area and that you think that the 200 foot TUA, which this developer would agree to in, in return for a major, and would have to go through a major special use permit is environmentally preferable. Is that right or no? Is that what I said? Did I get what you said? That's correct, and I think the one other thing that I would say is we, from the beginning of the project, our goal as staff was to try and figure out how to best uh, find the balance between new development intensity and what property owners expect to be able to do with their property and 
the environmental resource and protection of that and trying to find a balance that works. Um, the number of acres that are taken away in a 300 foot TUA are not insignificant. Um, so that there may be concern about that even if this site plan were not in place. Mm -hmm. But this site plan, the entitlements being in place um, and the ability under the existing zoning to, to really develop in what is very close up into the corridor is are some of the biggest things motivating our recommendation. Okay. All right. I think I'll have a little more later, but I think for out now I'm done. Uh, council members. Council Member Reese. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> she ditched me. Oh, okay. Yeah, good call. Can you address the concern that a number of folks have raised with me about this particular uh, proposal that what we're likely to get in the absence of light rail is a lot of single-story commercial development, um, especially in, um, I guess, support two, as opposed to a light rail project that would bring uh, more of a residential demand? Um, so one of the things that we have in place in our design districts um, is that a minimum podium height. Mm -hmm. So the podium height is the initial height that a building goes up before you're required to step it back in order to continue up in your allowable height. Um, you certainly could see a single story uh, commercial structure that's 20 feet tall. That's the minimum in support to. Um, so a I can't lot say of the, that that's not possible. Um, in fact, the, a lot of the commercial development that's in that area now, like the, where the Panera is and the music store, used to be a music store. Anyway, that's kind of at that height, right? I would think so, yeah. Um, and the, the portion that's in support, too, there's, uh, I think, one commercial property currently that may be a house. Um, so that area is, has not had the draw for commercial development. Um, I don't want to say it's not a possibility, but I don't see that being uh, as likely as seeing commercial interest in the areas that are closer to 15501 and 40, um, as opposed to on the south end of the Compi neighborhood. Looking at the map uh, of the proposed district, is it fair to say that the core um, is based on where the planning indicated the light rail station would be? This is, that may sound like a really stupid question, but I just want to make clear that I know what that why it's like that. Uh, yes, but I will say um, the, as I mentioned, the workshop that we had where we asked folks where they wanted to see the greatest intensity of development happen. <laughs> um, all of the area that's currently in the core and pretty much everything uh, that is to the west along 15501 and along 40 was also included. As we looked at implementing the affordable housing bonus, we wanted to, we wanted to make sure that there was around the proposed station an area where we had a little bit of shelter from potential, um, any potential negative impacts of the affordable housing bonus. So making sure that we would get some commercial or office uses that were not, um, having the suppressed height that we wanted to put in place in the majority of the district. And so that motivated us to shrink the core down um, in order to accommodate that affordable housing bonus and kind of protect the, the core area from uh, lower intensity non-residential development. But since light rail isn't happening and we're not exactly clear on what the new transit options will be along here, um, whether that includes some kind of BRT and a separate guideway with a separate station, some kind of transit station. We don't know where in this configuration that would be, right? We should That's know. correct. Although there is existing transit that serves um, at McFarland and Witherspoon, which is in mm -hmm. the center of the core. <coughs> and there's a pretty heavily used park and ride lot there as well. <clears throat> the choosing to go forward with this in the absence of light rail seems a little bit like um, a leap of faith. 
and the the leap, as you you describe, you didn't describe it that way earlier, but what you said was you believe that there would be sufficient transit alternatives to bring a necessary demand to this area, or sufficient transit service to induce the kind of development we want. Is that fair to say? Uh, to induce or serve uh, what is created, because I Chicken think and egg. both. Yeah. <laughs> both are important. Yeah. Um, but if that doesn't happen, what kind of development are we really incentivizing with this configuration if, there, if that doesn't work out? So I think uh, if the concern is that there's, you know, if, if transit isn't uh, either the transit that is does end up being proposed um, or enhanced, um, does not induce the kind of intensity that we originally foresaw with the, the light rail proposal. The worst case scenario with development, um, we have minimums in the requirements, which is kind of unusual for our zoning districts. Um, and so I think that we still, in our worst case scenario with these regulations, are gonna get better development than any of the existing uh, zoning districts out there provide. Um, we can't get the same sort of uh, suburban commercial uh, with very prominent parking <coughs> that is there now because of all of the parameters that are built into the design district framework. So I think that there is uh, we, we certainly want to be aware of and concerned about what intensity ends up there because I think, um, at least from our department's perspective, the compact neighborhood tier uh, mechanism is one that may, in you know, the county as a whole, look we may look to reshape where some of those compact neighborhoods are placed, but the concept is one that's really important to us being able to grow sustainably. And that even, you know, we know that there is not going to be the Durham Orange Light Rail, um, but we have an opportunity to create a transit system that serves places where we either have the kind of mixed use that we want to serve with transit or to create it around that transit system. Um, so I think, I think that with that is why, again, I believe that moving forward is, is still worthwhile. Shifting the way that we think about development and how we're growing is really important to the future of our community. Is it fair to say that the size of the design district was driven, at least in part, by the perceived demand for development that would be created or shepherded or however you want to put it, um, by the light rail project? So the, um, the, the boundaries of the compact neighborhood tier, uh, so before the reassessment that was completed in 2016, uh, the suburban transit area, which is what this was pre previously, which was basically a future compact neighborhood, um, ended at 15501. Sorry, no. Yes. Um, so it was it was expanded at that time. It roughly uh, accommodates a half mile um, or 15 minute walk, which is good transit planning uh, principle. One of the things that I think is worth noting is that in the increased transit service that is short in the short range plans um, for like for instance with the Route 10 15 minute headways includes a stop both on both sides of 15501. So even if we don't think that there's gonna be great pedestrian accommodation across 15501, which is a thing that we're working on with the 15501 corridor study, the opportunity for a transit to, to take you to either side and take you there frequently um, is in our short range future. Yeah, I think I'll hand over the microphone for a bit now. Mayor. Uh, Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, um, Lisa, for hanging in there. Uh, with us, so, so many of my colleagues have channeled um, so much, so many of my concerns um, and questions about this. I, I do, 
not really struggling. I, first of all, I want to echo the, the mayor's comments about how just a yeoman's job, your person's job, uh, you folk have done, uh, and the enormity of this piece of work. I, I, I guess for me, intellectually, the, the, this design district's vibrance and vitality has been so tethered to light rail since we've been talking about it that I, I guess intellectually for me, now that light rail is not going to happen, the, I wonder if some of the optimism about proceeding as it exists now in this configuration is fueled by, you know, it was going to be great whether we did light rail or not, or because we're not having light rail, we just have to make it great. Um, and and I, I guess I'm, I'm wrestling with some of that. But, I, you know, this, this planning department could tell us to rezone the moon, and I would. That's how much trust. I have them, but I do want to ask a question about the the how robust the support of stakeholders. Bracket out the conversation about the environmental conversation about the buffer. How robust is the support of stakeholders in the area sans light rail? I know that you worked gr a great deal with them when light rail was in the mix, but ha have what, what what is that? How robust is that support now? So I think that uh, it's a little bit hard to characterize. Um, we've obviously heard from some folks uh, here tonight that they're supportive of the project moving forward. Um, and I think that the, I'm trying to think of anyone. I think that the, the any lack of support for moving forward um, if anything is temporary as opposed to permanent um, in terms of, uh, I think at least one person requested some time. I think one of the things from our, pers from our perspective, as I've, as I've mentioned uh, maybe in a couple different ways previously, is that there are existing zoning regulations on the ground right now. Um, there's a lot of RS20 out there. If we want uh, two units of single family housing per acre, um, people can do that now. Um, they won't be constrained by the fact that the lift station doesn't have the capacity when you're dealing with single family uh, residential. So part of this is trying to put things in place that as the desire and need to develop occurs, that it will be done so in the, in the way that we have visioned for this area, but but also much larger, we want to kind of change how we're developing um, in certain pockets of Durham. That, that sort of anticipates my next and final question, by the way. Uh, uh, if we decide not to take action on this tonight or not to do it pending greater clarity on what our transportation options will look like in this area, the risk is... Um, so, yeah, certainly that there would be development kind of in the existing pattern. Um, there, uh, there's also, I think that there is a point in time where we have to decide as a community how we want to move forward, whether we want to change how we develop or not. And I, I think that depending on a transit system to tell us whether we want to do that, we, we were doing that because we had a transit project that was had a lot of inertia and was bringing us all along, whether, you know, whether some folks wanted to or not. Um, and I think in the situation that we're in now, we have the opportunity to set the land use policy and requirements in place that will create and shape the transit system that we want to have and will serve folks that are already, you know, it's already a high transit use area. Um, and I think that for that reason, it makes a whole lot of sense. And it's one of the reasons that this area was selected to be our first, uh, our first next compact neighborhood to develop regulations for, is because we thought about whether or not the transit system and the light rail uh, line would occur or not, whether we could still justify the work that we were putting into it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Freeman. Thank you. I, I really appreciate you going, going into that depth of um, exactly what the tension is and recognizing that currently, I mean, it would continue to be built out suburban, recognizing we don't own the land and 
whomever the developer is from Redding, California, or Chapel Hill, North Carolina, um, has that option to do more suburban residential at 20 units a square, I mean, uh, or an acre. Uh, what, I'm, what I am channeling, though, is I want to have the conversation about, which, which, would, uh, which is where I'm concerned. I want to have the conversation around how we're looking at six or seven generations prior to us where development was occurring and we were urbanizing downtown Durham on the east side, there was sewage being run into the river because they thought that that was the best way to alleviate the sewage in the area. And I don't want to do the same thing moving forward seven generations and setting up a, even with the owner in the area deciding to hold us hostage with mass grading, that we would consider if we're building in floodplains flood and we're considering how um, or not considering how this will have impact in the future, multiple generations ahead, I'm, I mean, I'm, I wholeheartedly support the development, the urbanization of that area because we cannot do it all in downtown. But I'm still concerned that we have not addressed the stormwater. We have not addressed how we would move forward in a way that's responsible enough multiple generations ahead. I'll keep saying that because if we don't, no matter how much housing you create, if there is no, if we don't have our water clean, we don't have trees, like all of these things matter in an ecological way that our ecological system is sensitive to and we have to be responsive to that. And I'm, I'm almost thankful that we had the chance to slow down without the light rail project forcing our hand to have these conversations, to really think about what it looks like to develop the zoning in a way that comprehensively looks at what this area looks like. I really appreciate the street gridding. I'm just not, I'm just not as comfortable with the way we're thinking about stormwater. I will say that in some respects, certainly what we were able to do <coughs> with regards to environmental protections with this work is significantly held back by our state requirements. And that's why I'm like, this is, this is a larger conversation that we're having. We're, we're kind of arguing with ourselves based on our risk being tied together so that we can't really protect our community and our land. And I don't want to push blame on one side or the other. I really want to make sure that we understand that this is a conversation we need to have statewide because we can't continue to, to develop these piecemeal projects. And even with the compact district, I mean, it's a larger district that you're trying to develop. But we're, I mean, water really matter, matters. And we have to figure out a way that, that we do this comprehensively and responsibly for multiple generations ahead. And so I'm, I'm really, I hear what, what, what many in the room are saying on the side of ecology, but I also understand like we have to urbanization, we have to move towards more urbanization. This is a great area to start in. I'm just, I really, I'm, I just want to be on the record and saying like this is really a horrible way to do it. Thank you, council member. Those were good comments. I'm going to, uh, let me just tell you where I am, Lisa, and take your suggestion and maybe the attorney's suggestion as well. Um, I am, for many of the reasons that I and others have said, I'm very much in favor of this rezoning. I do think that this is um, the way that we do want to grow. I think that it we 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 face you know the idea of a bunch of RS20 out there over the long term, and you know makes it much harder to do anything else out there once we want to. Uh, the resistance will be strong, uh, and I think that we have a really good opportunity to, as Councilmember Freeman said, urbanize. And I think it's a, the right place to do it. Um, I'm not sure about how effective the the, uh, the housing density bonuses will be in the short term, but I, I do believe that our region will come to its senses uh, before long and we will have transit out there. We already have transit out there, but we'll have significant transit out there, and it will be the, it's the first logical place to go. 
Um, I have more questions about some of the other areas that we're thinking about designing for the compact design, but, but, but not about Patterson Place. It already has a lot of the features that we want in an area, in a, in a district like this. And uh, appreciate Mike Waldrop being here. Mike and, and, you know, has been responsible for a lot of good decisions out there. The, so I do believe in, you know, Council Member Middleton asked about this. I think great questions, but I, I do believe that the transportation will get out there. Um, it won't be as soon as we want, but I think our region will be demanding it. The, uh, I do think, but, but I'm confused, honestly, is the word I will use, about whether or not what is actually best in terms of the, what's the, what's the best environmental outcome in terms of the TUA? Uh, because uh, normally I would say the 300-foot TUA makes sense. I understand it would reduce the, 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 the acreage to some extent, but that's something I, that's certainly a trade-off I could live with. On the other hand, I hear what you're saying about the threat to uh, the environment because of this developer's existing by right abilities to mass grade in the in the in the corridor. So, I really would like to understand this better before I voted. Um, because I think it's important, and I don't think I quite get what the true trade-off. It, it's hard for me to understand, because this is the first real discussion we've had of it. This is the first discussion I've had of it, and the council's had of it. What, this tra what is really the best way, what is really the best thing for the environment in terms of this trade-off? I don't, I don't get it yet. So I would like some more time to understand that, um, and uh, that, that could mean uh, holding the public hearing open, uh, and to a time certain when we could, you know, in, in the interim, you could give us some more education about that. Our friends from New Hope Creek could think about the things that you said. They could be giving us some information as well. Um, so uh, I would appreciate any advice that the planning staff, uh, our, the, the, the city attorney and I have whispered to each other about this. I know that she feels it's okay to hold the public hearing open and but I wondered what you all think would be advisable uh, for us to make a good decision. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to add that when you're ready for a motion, I'd like to. Yeah, it's Councilman Freeman. When you're ready for a motion, I would like to support that. Okay, thank you. Would you like time frame? Yeah, if, and should we do it? Yeah. I have, a, I have a question for staff about the, the sizes of the buffers. Do we know the difference in acreage between a 200 foot and a 300 foot buffer for this given area? Just for the area where the mass grading is in place? Um, or for the no, so, so looking at the zoning implementation report, you have an acreage listed for that area number one of 25.13 acres that could be mass graded if we, um, did a 300 foot buffer instead of a 200 foot buffer. Do we know the difference between the acreage of the 200, like what additional acreage could be subject to development if we had a 200 foot buffer rather than a 300 foot buffer? I do not have that information offhand. I think that the, I know that the property owner does. Um, okay. I don't know if they, Yeah, I don't have that number. Okay, I mean, there, and there could be additional considerations regarding the type of land that would be saved or not saved, but I think that question of what's the trade in terms of actual acres developed or not developed would be helpful for making that choice. But yeah, I was hoping we could do it right now, but since we can't, I would support the mayor's <laughs> request for Thank continuance. You. All right. Um, if I'm going to ask colleagues any objections to holding the public hearing open uh, for consideration of this question, and uh, anybody, Councilmember Reese, you're ready to go tonight, uh, Mr. Mayor. I, I, I mean, we this often comes up. We've got a ton of folks who came here tonight, um, waited a long time through a thick agenda to share their thoughts with us about it, and. I al I'm always reluctant to ask them to come back again at some later date, uh, but obviously the 
will of the group appears to be that we'd like some more information. I'd also like to hear a better case about why it makes any sense at all to create one of these districts that's bisected by one of the busiest roadways in this part of the state. So if we could hear some more about that next time, that'd be awesome. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I, I understand your reluctance. I appreciate it, but I think I want to do it for the next item, too. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you. We're going to hold this hearing. I, I'm going to declare that we're going to hold this hearing open until we have a date to recommend. So good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Pat Young with Planning Department. Um, really, it's at your discretion, so that doesn't interfere with other business that you have coming up. We, we can be prepared. We would at least, like at least two cycles so that we can prepare a supplemental memo that really drills down on the subject matter areas you identified tonight, um, particularly um, the ability f for this, these proposals to uh, be supported with another mode other than light rail uh, and, and drill down on some of the environmental trade-offs that were described. <coughs> All right. How about the 1st August meeting August the that's agreeable to us sir August the 5th we can have the material ready in that time frame thank you I will also say that I hope that you, you I would like to see that we don't just I know this is a small point no payday lenders in the <laughs> we can certainly make that change amen brother thank you Lisa great job thank you for Seriously, letting us Lisa, torture you. you for about an hour and a half thank you it was amazing Thanks for letting me sit down now well you did it you did it <laughs> You really did a thanks. great job, Lisa. Thank you, and all of you all who've worked on this. Many thanks. Much appreciated. Okay, long night at the Durham City Council. Assault. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Mayor? Yes. I, I would certainly defer to the um, city attorney, but I believe there needs to be a vote to continue it to a date certain. Motion. Can that be done? I don't usually. Okay. But I'm happy I wanted to, to make sure there were no procedural I, I, concerns. I like to do what Bill Bell did, Pat. <laughs> and no, Always a good idea. And no less. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Oregon Street closing, item 27. Good evening. I'm Emily Struthers with the Planning Department. Uh, Oregon Street closing, case SC 18-00001, was continued from the March 18th City Council meeting. A minor revision has been made to note eight on the plat for clarity purposes, and additional language was added to the staff report summarizing the privatiz privatization, oh, that's tough, of the water and sewer remains within Oregon Street upon approval of the street closing request. No other changes have been made, and staff is available for any questions. Thank you very much. Ms. Struthers. <clears throat> All right. Um, you've heard the report from staff. I'm going to declare this, well, this public hearing is open already. We're continuing it. And uh, we have two speakers, Robert Schunk, proponent, and Steve Houghton. I may have that name wrong, an opponent. Mr. Houghton here? Great. Um, God bless him. And uh, first, uh, Mr. Mr. Stanzial, you're going to speak? Okay. Mr. Sanziel, welcome. Are you, are you for this or against? All right, thank you. <clears throat> I'm sorry I have a little cold, so um, please excuse me. My name is George Stanziel, President and Director of Design at Stewart. I live at 115 Cofield Circle. Um, <clears throat> just want to be brief. I, I just want to bring some things to the council's attention. Um, Duke uh, owns all the property adjacent uh, to this, to this uh, portion of the street that we're asking to be closed. Um, it is located within central campus and is a um, relatively minimally used street. Um, <clears throat> Duke University has agreed to, uh, to an unrestrict uh, unrestricted access to the city until adjacent properties uh, adjacent to this uh, street closing, this portion of the street is, are developed. Uh, Duke has agreed to maintain all utilities as well as um, uh, uh, the street itself um, and has met all requirements of the city departments including um, a number of questions uh, over the course of the review period um, by the attorney's office. Um, and all of the requirements that have been included 
uh, all of the suggestions, requirements, changes have been included on the on the plats. Um, so um, I just want wanted you to know that it's um, it's gone through the system. It's gone through every department, and um, we just ask for your consideration. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Houghton. Mr. Houghton, please give us your name and address. You have three minutes. Yes. <clears throat> Steve Houghton, 312 Alexander Avenue. Alexander is the street one over from Oregon, which is the street we're talking about closing. And just as a preface, I found out about this um, proposed closing from a street sign last week. I understand now it's been going on for a while. Um, I've got pictures of those street signs. You don't want to see those at this late hour, I'm sure. But suffice to say that despite what I'm sure were the best efforts of planning to uh, make those signs visible. The sign on Irwin Road, one of the two from the east, is not visible on the sign on Campus Drive from the west, is not visible. Now, I haven't had time to discuss this with my neighbors, and I don't know how aware people affected by this closing would be as a result of that. The big issue, I think, is that Duke hasn't said what it plans to do with the existing central campus area after May 15th. And until we know Duke's redevelopment plan and its effect on traffic, including construction traffic and bus traffic, closing Oregon Street seems premature to me. There are currently three north-south roads connecting Campus Drive with Irwin Road and the central campus area. And uh, those three are, Anders, are Anderson, which is often congested, Alexander, and Oregon. It's not clear from the documents that I got online that have been posted on the city site <coughs> uh, whether and for how long Oregon will remain accessible to current <coughs> traffic. I understand you're talking about emergency traffic. Um, I'm thinking about students, employees, and visitors, um, about access to east and west campus, the buildings along campus drive, the Nasher, et cetera, access to sporting events, which creates a lot of traffic. Um, the fact that the proposal says that closing Oregon would create landlocked parcels along Oregon seems to indicate that Oregon will be closed to existing traffic. Now, I know that recombinations of lots have been done, to keep them from being landlocked, but if Oregon was to remain open, I don't think there would be landlocked lots on Oregon. So that suggests to me that uh, it makes me wonder how long, if at all, there will be general access to Oregon. Any traffic diverted from Oregon will necessarily use Alexander and Anderson. So before Oregon is closed, the traffic impact on these streets as well as on Irwin Road needs to be studied. Uh, final thought regarding road maintenance, because that was mentioned. Until two years ago, Alexander was under constant road maintenance because of the uh, Duke bus traffic going up the hill. Alexander's very steep. Mr. Mr. Houghton, thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate it. All right. Um, Mr. Stanzial, do you have any response to Mr. Houghton's concerns? Excuse me. Well, uh, first of all, I, I want to go on record as saying that Duke does not have a plan for Central Campus. The only thing that um, that they have been looking at, and then, you know, they have looked at it over the years, a number of times over the years, but there isn't a plan right now in uh, in place or contemplated uh, for Central Campus with the exception of potentially looking at replacing the, um, the student housing, which is very old and dated uh, on the campus. Um, so to my knowledge, the only thing right now that is at all under consideration is that there is no master plan, there's no plan right now uh, in place to do anything uh, with the campus. That, could that change? Sure, but it, at this point, there is none. Um, the as far as it remaining open to traffic, um, the can I Robert? Do you have that? Because we were asked to add this to the plat. 
this note. Until such time as properties abutting the closed portion of uh, Oregon Street are completely and substantially redeveloped, Duke shall provide unimpaired vehicular access to city and county fire and emergency access, emergency services, vehicles on a, main on a maintained traveling surface. <clears throat> so Duke is interested in maintaining Oregon Street actually to a higher level than it's maintained currently and will also maintain all of the uh, utilities uh, as well. But as far as emergency access, emerg uh, city access, county access, um, it will, it will, they have agreed to keep it open to city and county access. So that, I, you know, I don't have any other answers for him, um, but um, I think his major question was about redevelopment of the campus, and there is no plan to redevelop the campus at this point. All right. Mr. Mayor, a point of information, if I might. Sure. Um, we, we had requested through um, Stuart, Mr. Stanziel, Mr. Schonk, that the university consider a note that would clearly uh, allow unimpeded vehicular and pedestrian traffic to the general public until such time as all properties on Oregon Street were redeveloped. And the note that Mr. Stanziel read that limits that access to fire and emergency services vehicles was submitted by the university and by the applicant. So I just want council to understand that we had requested that that be unimpeded general public pedestrian and vehicular access. And, and what was proposed by the applicant was considerably less, met kind of the minimum needs for our emergency services and, and fire personnel. Thank you. Any thoughts on that? The, the university is not interested in granting that 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 vehicular access to a wider group of people. <coughs> I'm happy to talk to the university about that. Um, uh, if if that's the issue here, I, I'm happy to talk to them about that again. Um, we had a series of, of requests that went back and forth and we went back and forth with the city and landed on what we ended up with. Uh, if, if that is a significant issue, um, I'm happy to speak with them about it. All right, colleagues, what's your pleasure? Mr. Mayor, I have a question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I, I, um, I understand that there's no explicit plan uh, that Duke has um, at this time, but there is an explicit statement on the application um, for the reason for the closure to clarify responsibility for street maintenance Duke wishes to assume and to improve campus security. Uh, is there some particular data-driven concern in that area that Duke is uh, trying to address or a particular group of folk? Are you aware of that, Robert, in the application? I. I I don't. And the reason for street closure in the application. Have you, have you seen the application? Yeah. yeah. Did you I mean, write it's been that? a while. It's been quite a while. Oh. Do you recall Do you recall that? I do that recall reason? it, but I don't recall the reason for it. It's been a very long time. It's been in the process for months and months. It says to improve campus security. Does that sound familiar? Yes. So what, what, what's, what's the plan for improvement? Other I, than I suspect that it it's, it, I mean, it's so that they can control that street for, for campus security. So they can control the street for campus security. I'm a layperson. What, what, what does that mean? Well, I mean, so that their so that their campus security can control that street and maintain control of it from a from a security perspective. Okay. All right. I'll yield. I'll yield. Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to clarify: is that because until it gets converted to a private street, Duke University security can't patrol it? Is that the, the, they can they can patrol it. They do patrol it. Oh, okay. Their you know their position is that like they've done with a number of other streets on the university, they've closed a number of streets on the university over the years. That they they would like to see this piece of the campus closed uh, or made private, um, and that they see that as a um, as a positive in terms of their campus security. That's the only, the only answer I have for you at this point. 
if I might, Ms. Mitchell. So is, 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 is closing the street, is the anticipation that um, it's the street still will not be trafficked or frequented by folk who aren't matriculating at Duke? Is, is, is that the... I'm sorry. So How's it gonna be, is, is, the, is it anticipated that, you, say, you, see, you keep saying control the street, and by them controlling it, it'll make it safer. How do we, does that mean that they anticipate, um, how do we say this? Do they anticipate folk not, like just normal residents or citizens not walking through there? Is that what's gonna make it safer? Well, <clears throat> well I think that's, well, I think one of the questions is that, it, is whether or not Duke would allow full access along the street, which would essentially make it the same way as it is today, except it would be a private street rather than a public street. Like Campus Drive. Yeah, like Campus Drive, like a number of streets on the campus. Many, many, in fact, uh, when we were going through the process, the planning department had a, had a question, I don't remember what it was exactly, but it had to do with, um, uh, the precedent for closing the streets, and we gave them an, a, a laundry list of, um, of street closings that had occurred on the campus over the years. So, I mean, it's just, it, it's, the precedent is there. It's on their campus. They'd like to make it a private street. Mr. Houghton. Well, that's what I, that's. Mr. Houghton, I'm sorry, that is not, we don't do that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that, I hear the question. And I, what I said was that I would be happy to talk to them about that. Okay. Um. Mr. Mayor, if I could just find, with fun, fun, and I don't, I don't want to belabor the point. I, my questions are animated by, I mean, it doesn't say on the application precedent being established, we just want to close it because we want to close it. It, it says to improve campus security. So I, I, I'm not trying to I understand. badge you, but, but, but to me, that evokes some pretty specific concerns, and I just wanted to be clear about, about that. I appreciate um, so, that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Okay. Um, I have just a few observations, Mr. Stanzi out. Um, Mr. Houghton, I do think this was well advertised. I appreciate that you didn't see the signs, but I actually think it was done well, and it's been a long time, and anyone that missed it, I know we miss these things sometimes, but in fairness, I think it was done well. Um, the, um, you, you, you know, my original desire to hold this open had everything to do with the fact that uh, the university was uh, willing to stand in the way of our light rail project and expects us to just let them do any of their own transportation planning in the middle of on their campus any old way they want. Um, I am, um, but I, you know, in my, my own reflection, I think this is probably a poor vehicle through which to make that point any further. Um, I think it's a really important point. I think that we need to, we need, you know, I, I will just tell you, uh, I'm dismayed we haven't heard anything from the university about this. The only people we've heard from about this is Robert and you. We haven't heard a thing from the university. Nobody's called any of us that I know of. My understanding is that uh, Mr. Selig, Scott Selig, reached out uh, last Monday or Tuesday by, I believe, email. Well, I, I, I can't say that every single email that I get, I read, but as you know, I'm pretty good at it. Yeah, I know. Uh, maybe I missed it, but um, I, to my knowledge, nobody reached out. And maybe my colleagues got something. I'm not sure. Anybody get anything from Duke? Just yeah. So. No, I, I, I no. I specifically after you and I spoke, I I asked him to to reach out specifically to you. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'm, I I I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm just saying. I feel like we've made our point. Um, obviously unsuccessfully, uh, but I don't think this is the right thing to. This is not the right vehicle to have that discussion. Um, I hope we can have it in another way. All righty. Uh, 
the, the, if we are to approve this motion, it would be to adopt an order permanently closing 1,794 linear feet of Oregon Street. So moved. Mr. Mayor. Uh, is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Now we'll have discussion. Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate that. I apologize for my tardy request. No problem. Um, I wanted to lift up uh, an email we got about two months ago um, from uh, Adam Beyer, Durham community member, um, Duke, oh, now graduate maybe, is he? Did Adam graduate? Uh, yeah, yeah, a Duke graduate. Graduate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, asking. And, and, and employee. And yeah, and employee, that's right, that's right. Um, asking us to thoughtfully consider a number of issues around this closure, um, specifically around something that I think um, Mr. Stanziala let us know that, that there's no real comprehensive plan about what to do with it uh, once with this particular um, area. Um, and at one of the things Adam raised up is um, that seeding this to Duke without a plan for public consultation or much less a concrete proposal about what it wants to do with it um, is, uh, is unwise from a public policy perspective um, given the um, given some of the issues that the neighbor raised, um, but also just because of the proximity of this street to certain other areas, uh, like the Ninth Street corridor, for example. Um, he also identified that this is one of the closest uh, areas to Duke campus with uh, free on street parking, um, which I thought was a particularly um, apt concern for someone in this situation to have. Um, and I am, I'm concerned about it from the, pers from the perspective that Adam raised. I also definitely shared a number of the concerns that the neighbor raised. I'm sorry, sir, I forgot your last name. What is it? Mr. Houghton, thank you for being here. Uh, but I will say that a number of the concerns that he raised were also raised by a city and county departments in connection with this closure. Um, and it appears to me that a number of those concerns were addressed by uh, the applicant, uh, for example, that the concern that this would create landlocked parcels has been addressed um, by including recombination as a part of this street closure. Um, and the fact that for at least the foreseeable future, the, um, the street will, be re will remain open to cars and trucks, um, including um, emergency vehicles from the fire department, which is another issue they raised. Um, I, and so my, uh, my support for delaying action on it was uh, more aligned with uh, Adam's concerns than the issues that you raised, Mr. Mayor. Uh, but I think on balance, given where we are today and given the remarks that you've made, um, I will go ahead and support the closure uh, with the knowledge that the applicant has addressed many of the practical concerns that I had about it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. But I did want to say how much I appreciated hearing from Adam um, and look forward to hearing from lots of other folks in this area as, as we continue to see these kinds of requests. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just still need a little bit of clarity on the issue of access. It sounds like the city asked for access to be available to um, pedestrian and general vehicular traffic and that Duke responded with access will be available only to emergency vehicles. That's correct. I don't understand that. Um, <laughs> like what, how do you, how do you do that? How do you close the street and only allow emergency vehicles and not pedestrians, for example? What's that? Yeah, it was, well, it, it, but that's not her question. Her question is about pedestrians. So what he was saying was that it's emergency vehicles, solid waste, you know, everything, all of the, all of the city and county vehicles. But well, then your how question do you stop about, ordinary people from driving their cars down it? I'm sorry? How do you stop ordinary people from just driving their cars on it like they, you know, do every day to get from one side to the other? Well, I suspect that they would have the option of close, of blocking it off. They would, I, if, if then how do emergency street, vehicles get down? 
Well, it, I mean, it could be. Ten, I, I don't. I don't know the answer <laughs> to that. I mean, it could be temporarily blocked off. It could. Ha I mean, there are many places on campus that have, that have temporary. You know, blockades that they move for traffic. Mr. You know? I'm on the. Uh, Recognize the city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'm not sure if this is for Pat or, or Bill Judge, but uh, it's probably been eight, nine, ten years ago now. <laughs> One of my earlier council meetings, as I recall, I think anybody sitting at the dais but me was here. Uh, we had this exact conversation uh, for uh, what street was that behind Maxwell the Smith, Smith Warehouse, Maxwell Street. <laughs> had an extended discussion, almost uh, exactly the same conversation but I don't recall all of how that was worked out and resolved, uh, but it sounds very familiar to me. Do you remember that? So I believe, I believe in that situation, it was very similar, you're right, that they, that they gated it with a, a, a bar that can go up and down and that- During the- To your question, Mr. Mayor. Daytime it's open and nighttime it's closed. That's right. And then emergency vehicles would have a, a code or a, a signal that would open it. Same thing here, they could put up a fence, bollards, a gate, some kind of obstruction that could be activated or removed with uh, under agreement with emergency services. But also, it wasn't that uh, allowed for regular public access during the day and then closed at night, or? That's correct. That was stipulated very clearly in the Maxwell Street yeah. action. That in this case, there, there's no specification right. on the extent or degree of access that would be provided. Thank you. I would really like, I hate doing this because I know we're gonna do it again. But I would really like more clarity on that before we move forward with this, yeah. considering that this doesn't benefit us at all. It only benefits Duke. It seems like the least that we could ask for is for people to be able to continue to drive and walk down the street. So I'd like to hold this public hearing open. There's a motion. You're right, there is a motion. This is ridiculous. There's a motion that could be withdrawn. Um, What's your pleasure? We're gonna do it again in a minute. If, if we vote today, I'm gonna to know. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'd be fine to hold it. Excuse me. <clears throat> I feel fine holding the public hearing open. All right. Because of this precise issue. Right. Mr. Stanzial, it sounds like we're gonna hold this open to again. And That's fine. Again, to a date certain, and that date certain will be... Uh, when should we hold it open till? No, yeah. Mr. Mayor. I'm not we prepared want to be to careful how we play this game, Third, recognizing that when it's... Council member, hang on a second. I've got a question. Third or 17th? June 3rd or June 17th? We, we have no preference in that regard. Either one would be fine. Make it, we'll make it June 3rd. Council member? Yeah. Did you say June 3rd? No, uh, we want to be careful how we play this game and recognizing that. When it's, when it's okay, when it suits you to, to do this, it's okay, but when it's not, when it doesn't, it's not okay. It's an interesting kind of um, hypocritical um, approach to addressing an issue you have with Duke University. I don't support the way we're going about this. It's not good leadership. It's really not. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we have a motion on the floor. We'll either vote on it or the person that had the motion can withdraw it. I'm not, I can't remember who had that. I don't know who made that motion. I made the motion. Okay, Council Member Freeman. I think we should just move forward. All right, there's a second. Who had the second? Renato. Oh, I did. Yeah. You want to keep it? Uh, I would like to withdraw it. Okay. All righty. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? There's not. So it looks like we're going to hold the hearing open until June the 3rd. I've never now, let heard me just of say anything that, of the sort. How do you hold hold it after first and second and then take the second? I don't know. I've never heard that. I'm sorry. Can you explain how that works? Well, there's there's a motion. The mo the motion needs a second. And the and the person that had the second withdrew the second. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll get some answers. I'll just I'll just also comment that uh, you know, I appreciate the uh, what Mayor Pro Tem brought to us on this and uh, the questions that she asked. I appreciate the planning department for asking that of Duke. And uh, my original reason for wanting to hold this open, uh, I um, am happy to forego, but I appreciate these additional questions. 
So thank you. I do too. Thank you. Okay. Item 28, United Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment, tree coverage and landscaping revisions. <sighs> You're Thank you for staying. Uh, we'll now hear the report from staff. Thank you very much, Michael Stock with the Planning Department. I'll be brief. Uh, text Amendment TC 18005 includes amendments to landscaping, buffering, and tree coverage standards for additional buffers for residential development sites that are mass graded to establish or retain more tree canopy to modify requirements for street trees and to strengthen current specimen tree requirements. Uh, additionally, amendments pursuant to consideration of the trees Durham request submitted on October 2nd, 2018 are included. Uh, the, at the December 5th, 2018 JCCPC meeting, staff presented responses to trees Durham request and a draft text amendment. Uh, details as to how the trees Durham requests were addressed are within your attached memo. Uh, the Planning Commission recommended approval 10 to 1 of the text amendment on February 12, 2019. Uh, as a reminder, City Council will be required to take two actions. The first would be an action on the appropriate statement of consistency found as, as attachment A. The second would be an action on the ordinance amendment itself, attachment B. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. You've heard the report from staff. I'm going to first ask if there are any questions from members of the council. Any questions or comments from members of the council? If not, we have four speakers signed up. Uh, one, two, we have... One proponent, Donald Adu, but I don't see Donald. And then um, <clears throat> I see three opponents, Katie Rose Levin. No, I'm sorry, Katie Rose Levin and <clears throat> Laura Marie Davis. All right. Um, could you all please come here to the podium to my right? Um, Ms. Davis, yes. please uh, speak to us and give us your name and address, and you have three minutes. My name is Laura Marie Davis. My address is 1707 Valley Run. I'm also a member of the Environmental Affairs Board, and that's who I'm speaking on behalf of tonight. We did pass a resolution um, so expressing our endorsement of the changes to the ordinance proposed by Trees Durham. And I'd like to reiterate some of the statements that we made in that resolution. It is in the interest of the city of Durham to maintain at least 50% tree canopy cover to create a healthy, sustainable, and socially just city. Shade from trees can reduce cooling costs of detached houses by 20 to 30%, consequently reducing air pollution associated with electricity consumption and lowering resident energy costs. The reduced cooling costs is particularly relevant when we recognize that temperatures in cities can be as much as 22 degrees Fahrenheit higher than in surrounding rural areas. This is known as the urban heat island effect. And planting trees is widely recognized as an important strategy to bridge this gap in temperature. Tree-lined streets also reduce particulate air pollution by up to 60%, creating a positive impact on health, including reducing incidences of heart attacks, strokes, asthma, and pulmonary diseases, thus improving the quality of life of community members and reducing economic stress on families and the health system. There are additional environmental benefits to tree canopy cover, including an increase of 5% tree canopy cover that corresponds with a reduction in stormwater runoff by 2%. Additionally, there are economic benefits of a tree canopy cover. Several studies have found that the presence of trees increases property value from anywhere between 5% and 18%. In recognition of all of these benefits to the health of our environment and of our community, the Environmental Affairs Board strongly endorses the revisions to the planning department um, that have been recommended by Trees Durham. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Levin, welcome. You also have three minutes. Thank you. Um, my name is Katie Rose Levin, and I'm with Trees Durham. Uh, first, I would like to thank you all for having us and for staff and all of the work that you've put into uh, addressing our tree protection and planting ordinances. Uh, second, I would like to ask everyone who's here to support the stronger ordinance to stand or wave. Uh, we had a, a good contingent and most of us made it through to the end. So thank you all so much for staying on strong. Um, our goal is to create 
a healthy, sustainable, and socially just tree canopy, which we don't currently have, and we also would like to maintain a 50% tree canopy over the next 50 years or so. In order to do that, we have to dramatically change our planning ordinances. Um, so what planning has proposed is a step forward, but we still haven't reached even the floor that our neighboring cities have. And I'll go through that specifically in a minute. But Durham has made all these progressive votes to address carbon emissions, to address flooding, to um, become a progressive city. And these types of sort of nitty gritty changes are where the rubber meets the road or the trees meet the soil. And so we really need to get it right. So our main request is to ask for the, this proposal to be sent back to the planning department and back to the work session to increase it to at least the floor of what our neighboring cities do, primarily Raleigh and Chapel Hill. Uh, so in particular, there are a couple of ways that the proposal needs to be strengthened. First is we request a minimum of 10% preservation across all zoning and across all uses at least. So right now, it allows as low as 7% preservation in the urban core, which stretches pretty far outside of just the downtown area. 10% is what Raleigh requires, 20% uh, or plus is what Chapel Hill requires. So I think that we should at least be on par with our fellow cities. The reason why this is particularly important from a social justice aspect is that uh, in a lot of non a lot of communities of color live in areas which are zoned non-residential. And so by ensuring that all communities, regardless of zoning, have this minimum preservation, we're allowing for equitable distribution of tree canopy. Um, the second is for street trees. Street trees are an essential infrastructure. Uh, they work best when they're planted beside the street, a fact that the General Services has acknowledged because they're planting 1,500 trees a year in the city right-of-way. Uh, they've determined that this can be done safely using smaller tree stock, so we're doing it. Uh, we're doing it in a way that the city has already determined will not damage sidewalks and will not in impact utilities, and so we're asking for developers to do the same. Right now, that is not in the proposed code. The proposed code maintains the prohibition of planting street trees next to streets, and we request that the city council uh, make developers pay for this infrastructure so taxpayers don't have to keep going back and doing it. Oh, well, that went fast. Thank you very much, Ms. Levin. Appreciate it. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? This is a public hearing item. Is there anyone else in the public that would like to be heard on this item? No, no, I didn't know if you were going to close the public yeah, hearing. Yeah, I, 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 I was, I was going to keep it open, if, if, but I wanted to hear from Does anyone else want to speak on this? Okay. Um, we have uh, several uh, issues that um, that uh, the, the uh, advocates, the tree advocates, tree advocates have brought to us. They're requiring a minimum of 10% tree preservation on site for all new developments of two acres or more. Uh, the uh, the trees planting trees in the right of way and 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 so forth, um, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I just was going to say, Mr. Mayor, uh, the staff has no problem referring this back to a uh, work session discussion, but we would need some time to uh, evaluate and uh, come back with uh, the the our thoughts on uh, on the impacts of these proposals. Uh, I talked to uh, the planning staff earlier and thought that. Uh, uh, maybe sometime after the break, uh, we would be able to come back and uh, and have some more details uh, in response to the proposals, if that's what okay. you want. S planning staff, um, you've heard the manager. Is there a date that you would like to? Um... So, Mr. Mayor and members of council, uh, we would ask that this item, unlike the other items, be referred back to the administration rather than continued. Um, the reason for that request is we would like to align this um, closer with our expanding housing choices initiative, which we think this has a lot of um, overlap with. Uh -huh. um, we're not exactly sure the date that'll appear. So it, uh, the target date would be the second August meeting, but All we right. would ask that it be referred back to the administration. We will re-advertise it. All right. And then make sure it appears at a work session as um, you all have requested. All right, thank you. Uh, I believe we should have a motion to refer this back to the administration and then I will ask for such a motion. So moved. Second. second. It's been moved and second. We refer it back to the administration. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? The 
please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. We now move to item 29, consolidated annexation item. By the way, thank you, tree advocates, for staying. We appreciate you being here. We know it's a long night, but it's just as long for us. We don't like these long ones either. It's rare, but I know you find them as enjoyable as we do. Um, thank you for being here. All righty, we'll now move to item 29, consolidated annexation item, November Drive annexation. Good evening, Emily Struthers again with the Planning Department. Uh, regarding November Drive annexation, case BDG 16-00016, a request for utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning map change have been received from Sonia Ramadan for seven parcels of land, totaling approximately five acres, located at the southeastern corner of Umstead Road and November Drive. The site is presently zoned residential rural, and staff recommends an exact translation of this zoning district. The parcels are designated low density residential on the future land use map, which is consistent with the zoning request. While this annexation is for a non-contiguous expansion of the city limits, no department has raised service delivery concerns as the site is located between the existing contiguous city limits and an existing satellite area to the west. The site is located in an area which is surrounded by properties served by the city water and sewer, which was authorized without required annexation under earlier 1980s city policy. Additionally, this project is deemed revenue positive by the Budget Management Services Department. Should the council act favorably, approval of the annexation petition and zoning would become effective on June 30th, 2019. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt an ordinance annexing the property and entering into a utility extension agreement. The second is to adopt a consistency statement and the third is for the zoning ordinance. Staff is available for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Struthers. You've heard the report from staff. I'm now gonna declare this public hearing open and I'm gonna ask if there are any questions by members of the council. Hearing none, or is there anyone who would like to be heard on this item? Is there anyone here tonight who would like to be heard on item 29. Anyone here tonight who would like to be heard on this item? It is a public hearing. All right, uh, seeing none, I'm gonna declare this public hearing closed. The matter is back before the council. Uh, there's three motions necessary. The, the first is to adopt an ordinance annexing November Drive annexation. So moved. Second. second. It's moved and second that we adopt the ordinance annexing November Drive annexation. Ms. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you. The I second we adopt the consistency statement. <laughs> Thank you. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Is there a motion to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO? I move we adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. It's been, is there a second? Is there, it's been moved and seconded that we adopt an ordinance to amend the UDO Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. We have one more item before us tonight, and that's item six. Thank you all for your patience as well, for hanging with us this long. Um, this is the... Um, This is the resolution and recognition of the life of al Haj Malik al-Shabazz, a.k.a. Malcolm X. Um, and um, I'm going to, we, we have two people signed up to speak on this item. Uh, one of them is Jonathan Diane, and one of them is Carl Kenny. Uh, I think what, uh, I, I, why don't we go ahead and hear from the speakers. Uh, we are so sorry you all had to wait so long, but we appreciate you being here. Um, maybe we'll start with Mr. Diane, and you have three minutes, and then Mr. Kenny, you also have three minutes. Uh, Jonathan Diane, 1104 Anderson Street in Durham. Um, honorable Mayor Shul and Honorable Council. Uh, I have to start by uh, apologizing because I'm about to read. I usually speak from my heart. I think as a, a friend here, Nancy Gordon, has written something that summarizes it and a little bit more uh, um, 
it's written well, so I decided I, I will read. I hope you hear my heart, and part of a big community in Durham's heart as well in this, uh, in this uh, passage. Um, so I'll start. Without including wording in this proclamation against anti-Semitism and hate for others, including our Muslim brothers and sisters, explicit language that is inclusive and will bring us all together as human beings and renounce the exclu exclusion of people based on religion, race, or gender, this well-meaning proclamation will remain as yet another breach between the Jews of Durham and this body. Malcolm X was an incredibly important African-American leader whose views of white people evolved over time and after his visit in Mecca. Malcolm stood for the independence and strength of black men at a time when this was difficult to do and critically important. We now live in times that are polarized by politics, gender, religion, and race. And as Durham City Council, you must be keenly aware of the recently occurring anti-Semitic acts locally in North Carolina School of Science and Math and, the, and university campuses. The fast-paced national increase in anti-Semitic anti acts, I think we are in a historic high in the last 20 years. And the two synagogue shootings in California and Pennsylvania in the past six months, the Jewish community has concerns that the proclamation doesn't make explicit that in honoring Malcolm X, you are rejecting anti-Semitism. With everything going on in this moment of time, I suggest that council must make it clear that you are not tone deaf to our Durham Jewish community. We are aware that when Malcolm left the Nation of Islam, he renounced the nation, including Louis Farrakhan, and that he did not have any good relationship with Farrakhan. That alone, however, does not alleviate the concerns of the Jewish community, which need and deserve clarity. It's fair to honor Malcolm X as a leader, a black nationalist, and as a man who successfully rehabilitated himself and went from incarnation to a world community. We understand that after his detailed discussion of his conversion, he visited, uh, his visit in, to Mecca, his breaking with the nation of Islam, he moderated views about white people and Jews. So while I hope the Jewish community can take you at your word that this proclamation is not meant to be and is not anti-Semitic, the times we live, in, we live in cannot be ignored. I ask to continue just a little bit more. Sure. Thank you. To quote from a letter signed by all of our Jewish community leaders on April 24th before the California, this is before the California sh uh, shooting, one year later after this body had the statement, uh, uh, the Israel statement, as it regarded, we urge, please listen more. It's been a painful year in many ways. Again, this is before California. With increased open anti-Semitism and shootings, a year in which extreme voices were emboldened while voices of moderation and respect were ignored. Jews are an integral part of life in the triangle, and we are connected to Jewish communities around the world. 10 days ago, that's when they wrote in on April 24, uh, we celebrated Passover, a festival of freedom. Grateful for the gifts of America and praying for peace in Israel and Jerusalem. We remember a history that spans, thousand, spans thousands of years and commit ourselves again to participate in repairing God's work. Durham Jews remain committed to helping to build a Durham for tomorrow that is equitable, diverse, affordable, and a beacon of what's possible in North Carolina. We pray we can come together as a community, heal, and rededicate ourselves to building a city of equality, justice, and understanding for all of its citizens. Finally, the most important, we hope that you will demonstrate that you are a city council for all of us in Durham. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diane. Mr. Kenny, welcome. Please yeah. give us your name and address, and you also have three minutes. It's good to live in Durham, North Carolina, where um, this resolution is coming before the city council. Uh, I, I know of no other city that would be bold enough to consider such a proposition. Uh, and uh, with that in mind, I, I do think that it's, uh, it's fitting that the life of Malcolm be lifted up a as a meaningful witness of the, the life uh, and, and struggles of people of color, of black people who struggle to, to find meaning. Uh, Dr. King is known for making it 
uh, possible for white people to trust the voices of black people. And Malcolm uh, is responsible for helping uh, black people in this country uh, to tell stories in ways that fit uh, their human struggle. Therefore, uh, this resolution is important. Uh, it, it is it's, it's kind of interesting to me that it comes up uh, uh, at the proverbial end of the bus, uh, the end of your meeting, uh, and that Malcolm's life has been treated uh, in, in a similar kind of way. We know his story through Spike Lee's movie, but I think it's critical that in considering this proposal for the city of Durham that we think, think about why, why this uh, is a meaningful uh, resolution for the city of Durham. First, uh, we, we know the work of C. Eric Lincoln, Dr. C. Eric Lincoln, uh, who coined the phrase black Muslim uh, in his book on black Muslims in America and with his book, Race, Religion, and the Continuum American Dilemma, went even deeper into why uh, the work of Malcolm X and, uh, is, is an important contribution to the life uh, uh, of, of people. Uh, and Dr. Uh, Lincoln, of course, was in residence. He was a professor there at Duke University. It's important that we think about that. That, that the way we frame these conversations about Malcolm's life uh, is because of, of the contribution of Dr. Lincoln. It is also important that we recognize uh, that riot on the campus of, of Duke University, the taking over the Allen Building, and that the students who took over the Allen Building did so because of their desire uh, for, for Duke to be more involved in, in the study of Afro studies. Uh, and that group afterwards established at Malcolm X University here in the city of Durham uh, in 1969, and, and it st stood in the city uh, until it was relocated to Greensboro, North Carolina, because of Durham Freeway coming in, enforcing uh, a, a movement of, of, of that university. But I think the most critical piece for us as we think about uh, the, the criticisms that may be coming from those within our Jewish community is a contribution that uh, Wallace D. Muhammad, the, the person who took over the work of Elijah Muhammad, the son of Elijah Muhammad, close friend of Malcolm X, close friend of Muhammad Ali, uh, sent to the city of Durham, Aman Abu Wahid, who was well known in this community for being an advocate of conversations between black, uh, the Jewish community, Christian communities, and Islamic communities. Uh, he was sent here by uh, uh, Wallace D. Muhammad and his contribution as one who is central to the way we think about faith uh, it makes this proposal one that is one deserving because of the work that continues uh, uh, in our city, uh, the work of Malcolm that continues as an extension uh, of the work, uh, it continues through the work of, of, uh, of Walid Muhammad and it also continuing now through the work of Aman Abdul Wahid, uh, who is the minister in our community. Uh, who continues that legacy. Uh, we thank you for consideration. We pray you will do this. Uh, I think it, uh, in, in, in summation, that um, given all that has taken place in the community with the increases in crime, uh, I think that uh, this, this resolution will go away, a long way and be given a different conversation around how communities that are troubled by crime can, can make a radical shift in the right direction. We thank you for consideration. Thank you, Mr. Kenny. <coughs> Council members, uh, I think I'll next turn to uh, Council Member Freeman. Do you have any comments? I'll hold my time. Okay. Anybody have any comments at this point? Uh, I'll, I will, uh, I had not uh, planned to do this. I talked to Council Member Freeman earlier about this, that I think that, um, I think that the resolution as it stands now is, is actually uh, very uh, clear and positive. Uh, however, and, and I had suggested, Council Freeman and I, Council Member Freeman and I talked earlier about the fact that I think what the council ought to do in the near future uh, is to issue a sort of freestanding resolution uh, about anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, both of which are uh, definitely uh, anti-Semitism is on the rise in our country. There's no question about that. We have seen what happened in the recent synagogue shootings, which are. Um, unprecedented in the recent past, um, and we know uh, all the Islamophobia that exists in our country. Um, but I will just say that I, I have no problem also with adding a, 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 an additional whereas, which I will, uh, I will read to you all and uh, see if this uh, meets with your uh, approval. 
Uh, whereas this council is unalterably and adamantly opposed to the scourges of anti-Semitism and Islamoph Islamophobia, it is committed to fighting these evils wherever and whenever they appear. I think that's an unequivocal statement uh, mm. against anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, and uh, would be interested if you all are, are uh, interested in adding that to the resolution of Councilmember Freeman and others. Sure. Anybody? Mark Anthony, do you want to? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I um. I think we should unequivocally and in a full-throated way issue a freestanding statement on anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And let, let me tell you what my, my struggle is. Um, so, so often, um, and I hope my heart is heard, so often black leaders and, and black folk in general in this country have, have been asked to take that extra step to prove our legitimacy, validity, patriotism, love of country. Um, we honor Dr. King, but so often we, we, you know, we're asked to, while we honor Dr. King, to renounce communism, just in case, um, because so much of his work was uh, reputedly informed by communism and, and, and outside agitators. Um, li lifting Malcolm X, El Haj Malik Al Shabazz, Malcolm X up, um, as we know him to be and what he represents, um, to, to suggest that, but just in case, because you know you might be kind of in a left-handed way trying to, to make a statement that we support, uh, 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 we, we want to stop our consideration of him at a particular point in his evolution rather than a complete person, um, to me, as, as a black man, as a black leader in this city, uh, harkens back to uh, uh, those days when we have to always qualify uh, ourselves as, as, as a leader, as a citizen, that we're always suspect. Um, there's always that lingering question that, oh, are you really such and such? So you got to go extra. Um, we, we have uh, a leader who's having stuff named after him in other countries for moving an embassy, but this same leader um, uh, said that folk who were yelling Jews will not replace us were very fine people among them. Um, and it seems like he gets a pass. I think, and, and I will, I, Mr. Mayor, I will volunteer to lead the effort and meet with whoever in this community to, to craft a standard uh, uh, statement, a resolution against anti-Semitism and anti-Islamophobia uh, that would put the rest of the nation to shame. I'll work on it. Um, and I, and you know, without touting it, uh, that's the record that I've tried to build in this city for over 20 years with folks. So I, I, I'll work on that statement. But I think that uh, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia deserve its own standalone statement uh, because it's that important an issue. Um, Malcolm X is, is a, is like many historic figures, is a complicated, multifaceted uh, person uh, that evolved. Um, we can't talk about C.P. Ellis without talking about the Ku Klux Klan. As a matter of fact, what makes the story of C.P. Ellis so compelling is because he was in the Ku Klux Klan. Um, Yet we, we've had a very celebratory moment with the, the releasing of the best of enemies, um, and we didn't require that author to put a disclaimer about the Klan in their book. And, and I don't want to, I think we can do both things. I think we as a city can make a firm stand, and we ought to make a firm stand, and, and it's overdue for us to make a firm statement against anti-Semitism and also not play into that, that Chris Rock once said that black people's uh, relationship with America is complicated. It's kind of like your uncle who paid for you to go to college but molested you. Mm. Uh, 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 it, it's a nuanced uh, uh, relationship and it's a difficult relationship. And, and I hope that folk around the city and listening to me tonight will understand that um, there's, there's, there's a fatigue as black leaders and as black people always having to prove that we're patriotic enough, 
that we're not fill in the blank enough. And, it's, and, and I don't think it's unwitting. I don't think that people are insidious when they ask us to do it, but you have to understand how, how exhausting it is to have to do it all the time. This statement of this resolution to honor Malcolm X is to honor the Malcolm X he came to be, not a, 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 a photograph or a snapshot of a particular point in his life. Um, and I'm sorry that folk don't trust this council. It, it, it breaks my heart that folk don't, folk don't trust this council. And I hope we'll work to regain that trust. But I will not, uh, 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 as, a, as a black man conversant on some of the things that have happened with leadership and some of the techniques that have been used, wittingly or unwittingly play into this notion that we have to always go the extra step to prove ourselves. This resolution uh, is not secretly trying to prop up anti-Semitism. It's trying to honor a life um, who at the end of it, at the end of his life, was a paragon of virtue and how we all should be looking to, to foster uh, uh, interpersonal, interracial, and interreligious relationships. That's what we're honoring in this resolution. That's what I'm voting for uh, tonight. And uh, after this vote is over, you can put my name down as one of the people that will work on crafting uh, a model statement of anti-Semitism uh, and Islamophobia for this nation. Uh, because it, it deserves to stand alone. Uh, so with that said, Mr. Mayor, I don't think we should add a whereas to this particular resolution. I think we should do the work of crafting a freestanding resolution and pass this resolution uh, as it stands tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Anybody else? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We received an email today with a suggestion that I liked and I thought I would just call our attention to it in case other folks like it as well, um, that, that we could in this resolution highlight the way in which Malcolm X at the end of his life um, became a person who was very interested in rejecting all forms of bigotry and especially after his trip to Mecca when he returned and he spoke on um, having seen Muslims of all races and all colors together changed his views on, um, on race and on uh, some of the issues that he'd seen in America. And so one of the quotes that was included in this email um, is that Malcolm X said, what I have seen and experienced has forced me to rearrange much of my thought patterns previously held and to toss aside some of my previous conclusions and later said, I can state in all sincerity that I wish nothing but freedom, justice, and equality, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all people. Um, I think that I, I agree with Council Member Middleton that I wouldn't support including um, an anti-Semitism disclaimer in this resolution, but I would support including some of Malcolm X's own words um, clearly demonstrating that he, um, at the end of his life, had a very different view um, than some of his earlier writings and thoughts on, um, on these issues. OK, you've heard this suggestion. Comments? Mr. Mayor, if I might, I, I as always, um, always respect the, um, the words and the views of the mayor pro tem. I, I think that the fact that we're passing the resolution is indicative of our understanding that, uh, again, this, this kind of air of suspicion that there's something that, that, for me, I have never read anything about Dr. King that said enough. You know, that honored, you know, they didn't print the whole text of the letter from the Birmingham jail. Uh, he's one of my heroes, so, so there's, not, there's nothing they've written about Dizzy Gillespie that for me was superfluous <laughs> enough. I think that um, <clears throat> I think we have to have, have an honest conversation, that we have to honor our, our Jewish brothers and sisters, uh, but we also have to honor who we are as well. And they're not mutually exclusive. And, and I think that um, wherever we come down on this resolution, there's something else we could say. Um, and as I said, and I'll yield after this, um, we, have, we have had a culture of great deference on this council when one of us have brought resolutions forward. We, we've passed resolutions on this council that I would have written differently, 
and and some of us stated have stated publicly that statements we've passed on this kind, including the policing statement, uh, that some of us would have done it differently. But because we have a, a, a culture of deference to one another, the threshold has been incredibly <laughs> Uh, uh, um, high, if you will, the bar has been incredibly high when we would make um, um, substantive uh, changes to it. So, so I, I, I want to <clears throat> honor that culture of deference that we've shown to one another, firstly. And secondly, I'm not sure what we're trying to fix in this resolution by, by continuing. We, we had a work session. We made changes to it. I'm not sure what we're trying to fix. My suspicion is that we're trying to address concerns that I think need to be contextualized, and those concerns need to be addressed not with a, an additional few words in a statement. By the way, sta a resolution on Malcolm X is precedented. And I would encourage all residents to go back, and citizens to go back. This council, as an institution, has passed a resolution before about Malcolm X. Um, so it's not unprecedented. What's different now are the things that our friends have said are different, and they're right. Where the, the anti-Semitism is up. We live in a crazy time, which is why I think that, that the, what's different now deserves its own treatment. It deserves its own full-throated, standalone treatment. Um, but I, 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 again, we can do that, and we can also not unwittingly uh, play to this, 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 this trope that there's something suspect about black leaders, that we have to go a little extra further, a little further, to prove that we're okay. We, kn we know the Malcolm X that we're honoring now. And, there, and I understand there's a mistrust of this council. I get that. We have to work to, 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 to regain that trust. But I don't think adding a few words to a resolution that is not unprecedented uh, to a Malcolm X resolution is the way to do that. The way to do that uh, is to do the work, to have honest, heartfelt conversations, and to pass an anti-Semitism uh, anti resolution on its own because it deserves it. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Alston. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Three things. I want to just in this meeting, kind of in this space, endorse the um, kind of quote that the Mayor Pro Tem read, the spirit of it. Um, and um, yeah, kind of the, 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 with that as kind of the animating piece of why we want to honor Malcolm, X, honor Malcolm X and um, note that like, that's, that's behind the celebratory tone of this resolution. That said, I'm fine to pass this resolution as it's written and to craft a standalone resolution that addresses the issues that you, Mr. Mayor, and um, Council Member Middleton have kind of detailed and illustrated um, in this conversation. So that's where I am. Thank you. Anybody else like to be heard? I just say that I found the words of Council Member Middleton to be incredibly compelling. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I know that's the first time I've ever felt that way, but I did. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I think that we're ready unless anybody else has anything else. Anybody? I would, I would like to add that I, I appreciate um, all the viewpoints that have been shared. And I, I mean, I, I come at this from a place of recognizing just how difficult it has been to even have the conversation around Malcolm X or the Nation of Islam, knowing that in these times that we're in, it's important to make sure that people are speaking out and up. And so I have no problems with anyone saying what they need to say, which is why I wanted to make sure I gave space because I brought it forward. And I think it was important to make sure that we heard everyone's voice. Um, unfortunately, we didn't hear some of our council members this evening, but hopefully they will continue to, to um, think about it and start to think about what they feel around this resolution and the issues that we're facing in this country because they're all tied together. We are all human beings in this country. It is not about religion and faith and race and all the things that we talk about. It is just the outcomes that come from those things that, that have been created to differentialize each of us. And so recognizing that we're all one. We are all one body. And it frustrates me to even have to have this debate, but I recognize that this is, this is the time that we're in. And so all of the phobias and all of the isms become a, a matter of, you know, I've got to scream my story. I've got to tell why I'm hurt. And I feel like we're in an oppression Olympics that I'm just not okay with. And so that 
that kind of like negativity, I, I can't, I can't deal with. It's really like, it's so, I mean, I can't, I can't think of any other way to think about it than it's just so unchristian. Like I can't, it, it just doesn't live in me. And so to even hear people discuss it and talk about it in the ways in which that frame me as something that I'm not is frustrating, it's uh, angering, but I step back and I look at this because it is not about me as a person. It is about the context in which it was written, which is recognizing that the people who are descendants of slaves in this country do not get to, get to stand up and say, say things, honor me at all. There were emails about a statue being taken down and I was sitting there like, when has there been a Malcolm X statue that could even be taken down? And I mean, the, the whole conversation and context is set in white supremacy. And unless we're, de we're deliberate in having the conversation around how we address what that structure is, I don't, really, I don't really feel like we're doing anything. And so I'm okay with the stones being thrown my way. I'm okay with all the knocks. I'm okay with being thrown under the bus. I'm okay with all of that if it moves us forward in having the conversation and actually being serious about who we are as a people in this community. It is, it is far more important for us to talk and to address how there are so many black men sitting in jail. And night after night, as I receive these messages that there are black men laying dead on the street, we, we, we're, not, we're not equipped, we're not ready, and we're not doing enough, which is why earlier this, this evening, when uh, Dennis Gaddy and Jackie Wagstaff were standing up saying, well, what are we going to do? It's frustrating that we sit here and act like there's nothing happening. Like, we're, I mean, it's okay. So we're in uproar. We get emails. I mean, I mean the, the person who was killed yesterday by a, by, on a bike, my heart breaks each time we lose one person. One. It doesn't matter what race. It doesn't matter what faith, it doesn't matter what gender, it doesn't matter what sexuality, it doesn't matter. It is, it is a human being. We have to see each other in each other. And until we get to that point, I'm going to keep bringing these types of resolutions. I'm going to keep bringing these types of conversations, and I'm going to keep being that thorn that says, this is not enough, this is not okay, and we have to do more. I, I can't express enough how I know I'm passionate and it comes across as anger. And I know that when I'm speaking, I'm trying to be careful that I don't hurt the people that I care about in this community. I'm very clear that, that, that words do hurt, <clears throat> but I'm also very clear that if we don't say it, if we don't have the discussion, that we're not gonna get anywhere. And so I, I mean, I'm, I appreciate that the mayor pro tem and the mayor have offered the whereas is that they think should be in this resolution. But I'm also recognizing that they have not offered any whereas is in any other resolutions that have come forward other than my own. And so that concerns me in a different way. But I want to say that this, this conversation is not the end. I, as I said with the mayor earlier today, I, I mean, I think it's important to make sure that we do continue this conversation because we're not going to come to any solutions that will actually have impact. So I, I I mean, I, w I really would like to figure out how we get past this impasse of this anti-Semitism and, anti and Islamophobia, but I know that it's not going to happen tonight, and I know that it's not going to happen through Malcolm X, but I do know that we can continue to have the conversations and we can continue to push forward in a way that we're intentional about repairing these harms that have been caused, because there have been harms caused across the board for multiple generations, for multiple scales and reasons in multiple countries. And I mean, if it starts with this, I'm, I'm happy. That's all I can say. Councilmember Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my colleague, Councilmember Freeman, uh, seemed to encourage those of us who had not spoken to speak out to that tonight. And I'll honor that um, uh, in this space tonight. I want to just briefly mention that Jessica Bridgers, the young woman who was struck on her bicycle in the early morning hours of Saturday this weekend at the intersection of West Club Boulevard and Duke Street, did not die. She is uh, very seriously injured. Um, there's a GoFundMe that helps support her medical care and her family and encourage folks to look for that if they're 
interested in helping that family. I would also just gently uh, note uh, for the record uh, that I um, was the principal drafter of this council's resolution opposing House Bill 2 and calling for its repeal. And I can guarantee you with 100% metaphysical certainty because I was there and it wasn't fun that every member of the council at that time uh, had suggestions about how to change that resolution and include whereas is. Uh, so you're not alone, Council Member Freeman, um, in, uh, in uh, receiving feedback on resolutions. Um, I will say that I think those suggestions might have been more appropriate at the work session where we dealt with this. And unfortunately, I was not there, as my colleagues know, was granted an excused absence so that I could be out of the state to help a relative who was recovering from surgery. But uh, I listened to the recording of the, of the work session um, and was heartened by the spirit with which all of my colleagues addressed themselves to this resolution, the suggestions that they uh, made um, to address concerns raised in the community. And I especially uh, wanted to thank uh, Council Member Middleton, uh, who um, worked hard to find common ground on this particular issue. Uh, Council Member, sorry, the Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Johnson, who raised the concerns and had some uh, suggested changes. Uh, but most importantly, I want to thank Council Member Freeman, who um, championed this uh, resolution all the way through, was willing to accept. Uh, changes that she might not have otherwise made to the to the resolution in order to find common ground with uh, her colleagues um, and has expressed uh, very clearly her uh, passionate views about this and other issues tonight. I just want to thank you for being who you are. In closing, I want to say to the to our Jewish the Jewish members of our community that I think, as you can see, all of the folks up here on the dais. Um, are prepared to exclaim with a loud and clear voice um, that anti-Semitism has no place in our community. Um, and I think that your desire to have that expressed clearly and unequivocally um, is not part of any kind of oppression Olympics. It is your right as members of this community. Um, and I think uh, we will, uh, I, I'm encouraged by Councilmember Middleton's volunteering himself to, to, take, to shoulder that work, and I'll volunteer to work with you on that um, because I think we are going to need to um, to make it very clear that um, that that we don't we, we don't support anti-Semitism, which is kind of obvious. Um, with respect to the resolution itself, um, I think where we landed. Um, is a fitting tribute to the man who died as El Haj Malik El Shabazz, but who was commonly known as Malcolm X. Um, obviously, uh, like any other uh, person, um, as Councilmember Milton has said, um, we change and grow as people. Um, and we honor, uh, as we do with any person, we honor the good. Um, and I think that's what this resolution does. Um, and. Uh, we wouldn't be the people that we are if we didn't grapple with the right way to do that together. And I feel like that's what we've done throughout this process. And so I thank all my colleagues and happy to vote for the resolution when the time comes. Thank you, Mr. May. Thank you. Any other comments? Yeah, uh, I just want to say I'm tired and it's late. I support <laughs> Council Member Freeman's uh, resolution as it stands. Um, and just to say that uh, I also appreciated where we landed at the work session because I felt that it was a compromise that everyone felt comfortable with. Um, we will all be, I'm sure, over the next several months submitting our own proclamations. Um, and I hope that we continue to push each other where we need to be pushed, but always um, maintain a spirit of collaboration. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member. Council Member Middleton and Council Member Reese, I heard you volunteer to write a, uh, write a resolution uh, against anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Uh, how would you feel about doing that by the 6th of June work session? <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm, I would love to, and, and, but I do want to also do that in consultation um, and in a discussion with, with community leaders um, in the it city. It gives you a month. Absolutely. Okay. That's fine. 
this couple. So those of you at home I, listening, we have our marching orders. June the sixth. Yes, sir. Charlie, are you with me? One hundred percent, my friend. All right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good. All right. Thank you. That was a very uh, enlightening discussion. And again, Councilmember Middleton, I really appreciated your remarks. I think that was you, very helpful. Um, okay. We have a do we have a motion to approve this resolution. Move to approve. Second. Um, Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 7 0. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, there being no more. Mr. Mayor, Mayor, just making sure that I do read the resolution. I know that um, the um, reentry council uh, left at around 10 o'clock, but um, Ben Haas has waited this long to receive the resolution as written. That's okay. I want to thank um, both uh, members of the Reentry Council, um, Ben Haas and Darren, or um, Demetrius, Demetrius Lynn. Lynn, for being here. Um, I know Demetrius had to cut out, but um, I appreciate you staying through the whole meeting. And uh, I want to just acknowledge that last week was Reentry Council, or I'm sorry, the <laughs> week, current Reentry Week. And a lot of events happened, and um, hindsight, I wish we'd have had this a week earlier. But um, reading the resolution, in recognition of the life of El Haj Malik El Shabazz Malcolm X, whereas Malcolm X born as Malcolm Little, the fourth of eight children to Luis, a homemaker, and Earl Little, a preacher, who was also an active member of the local chapter of the Universal Negro Improvement Association on May 19, 1925, in Omaha, Nebraska, and whereas Malcolm X faced significant amount of racially motivated violence in his early life when his family was targeted as his father was killed because of his father's role in the civil rights movement, leaving his mother a widow, and whereas Malcolm X faced additional trauma as a child when his mother was committed to an insane asylum in 1939, and Malcolm X and his siblings were sent to foster homes or to live with family members, and whereas in 1946, Malcolm X was arrested on charges of larceny and sentenced to 10 years in jail. While incarcerated, transformed his life, dedicated himself to self-improvement, and recovered from his addiction. Educated himself, even read the entire dictionary and other such large volumes of books during the six and a half years he was there. Converted to Islam before his early release from prison in 1952. And after his release from prison, Malcolm X became a minister in the Nation of Islam, a human rights activist, a prominent civil rights leader who influenced the work of various organizations around black nationalism during the 1950s and 60s. And whereas in 1964, Malcolm X resigned from the Nation of Islam and announced his founding of the Muslim Mosque Inc., an Islamic movement and organization devoted to working in the political sphere and cooperating with civil rights leaders. And whereas, also in 1964, Malcolm X made his first pilgrimage to Mecca and returned for the second trip to, Ar to Africa and Arab nations aimed at organizing international support to fight to end human rights violations against blacks in America. And whereas, upon returning from the Hajj to Mecca in his second tour of several African and Arab nations, Malcolm X was given a new name, El Haj Malik El Shabazz, from Sunni Islam. And upon his return home, he called the first meeting of the Organization of Afro American Unity and proclaimed he found the true brotherhood of man. And whereas El Haj Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X was assassinated February 21st, 1965, at 39 years old, 39 years old while preaching on the possibility of a peaceful solution, resolution to America's race problem. And whereas El Haj Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X has many speeches and written works 
which form core pieces of knowledge regarding the history of civil rights, of the civil rights movement and black nationalism in the United States. And whereas El Malik, El Haj Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X never stopped working to better himself as a formerly incarcerated individual through his dedication to faith, self-knowledge, and his unselfish pursuit of black liberation, denoting true brotherhood until his assassination. And whereas El Haj Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X will be remembered for his con contribution to society, underscoring the values of true free populace by demonstrating the great lengths to which human beings will go to secure their freedom. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the city of Durham hereby recognizes the valuable contributions and sacrifice of El Haj Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X, and hereby urges all residents to hereby honor the late Malcolm X for his resilience, service, and dedication to the empowerment through knowledge and to, through knowledge and to all human rights. And be it further resolved that the, the Durham City Council calls on the governor of North Carolina and our state and federal legislative delegation to actively support reentry programs and services for our returning community mem members, especially those in the black and brown community who are disproportionately jailed in our current criminal legal system. Thank you. Witness my hand on the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this day, the 6th of May, 2019, Stephen M. Shule, mayor. Thank you. So it's good to be here representing the Religious Coalition for Nonviolent Durham and also Local Reentry Council, which is dozens of agencies from around the county who work with reentering individuals, community members coming back to our community and behalf on all those folks and a lot of folks, people of good faith and goodwill around Durham who just to bear witness to the joy and transformation that has come among those hundreds of folks from getting to know fellow citizens who come home, their eyes light up, y'all. And so as late as the hour is, I just want to say on behalf of all these folks that these stories matter, holding stories like this up to the community we imagine matters, and I think this resolution matters. So thank you for taking the time to say it right and say it well. Uh, I think there are a lot of folks who resonate with the struggle and the intention that's represented in Malcolm X uh, that are appreciate living in a city that, that agrees with them and is excited about them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haas. There, there being no more business to come before this body, we are adjourned. Good morning. <laughs>